time for the next stage. My imagination feels more free. It's not a radically changed show. The point is now for gatekeepers like me to make way. That's when you really improve things. It's our heritage. It's a brand, a franchise. I read their scripts and they're rubbish. They don't actually love television, so they don't know how to write for it. That's why I'm optimistic. Television can make things better, and the teenagers making new forms of it are going to change it all over again. Those were a sampling of quotes from the Russell T. Davis interviews and sources we're going to be looking at today, as we continue to discuss the continuing development of the second Doctor Who era of Russell T. Davis. There's never a dull moment, as from this vantage point of February 2023, David Tennant's three 60th anniversary specials have been filmed, and his 14th Doctor continues their adventures in the liberation of the Daleks comic, which we'll also continue to discuss here. Meanwhile, 15th Doctor Shuti Gatwa is increasingly cited filming series 14. Interesting, complex, and thorny topics and discourses continue to sprout out from new developments and interviews, and so we're going to dive into all that today. The divers today are myself, Neo from Australia, along with my friends Ingiga from England, and Nate Bumba from the United States of America. Over the last few weeks, since our last RTD2 Russell T Davis chat, the I'm Needed RT Disney and RT Discourse one, What's happened? What's new? What's emerging, guys? Oh, let's see. Um, there's spin-offs seem to be looming large at the moment. There's the spin-offs. There's interviews that RTD has done and all the drama that's spun up. Generational conflict. And Star Trek, of course. Nate, since it's your first time on a second era Russell T. Davies conversation with us, uh, do you want to share with us your general read on RTD2 so far? What are your general thoughts on this and how it's all been going? Sure. Yeah. My expectations for the future of Doctor Who uh, were kind of rock bottom. And so this whole announcement and even the involvement of Disney Plus is something that I've gotten really excited about. You know, I know a lot of people are worried about what the, you know, Disney involvement will look like, what impact that'll have. But I really trust RTD and I think... I mean, frankly, even if it is very new and different, um, it's going to be, I, I really have a hard time believing that it'll be worse, frankly, than what we've had. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I'm optimistic. Right. I think regardless of what one thinks of the quality of the Chibnall era, how much they enjoyed it and engaged with it and so on, things did feel a bit touch and go for the future of the show for a minute there. That's not some coded put down of the Chibnall era or anything, not at all. That's something the (laughs) execs from the era have spoken directly to. Uh, And more so than most people we have on regularly, you, Nate, are super duper engaged with the wider universe of Doctor Who. I mean wider universe of Doctor Who and the series it's connected to uh, spin-offs beyond the televised ones and the most well-known audio ones. Uh, Faction paradox and lots of the wilderness era stuff and lots of older and niche esoterica. So it's always it's interesting to hear your optimism here because it's always interesting to hear your perspective uh, since it's founded in a pretty unique experience of the, I guess I'll be calling it a franchise now, Doctor Who. RTD's been saying that. Uh, you know, in an interview recently uh, with the Radio Times, Peter Davison spoke to what he sees as a kind of ongoing maybe even inherent ropiness to the show, to Doctor Who. Uh, He said, speaking initially of the Jodie Whittaker final special and then later of Russell's first run of the show. Um, Yes, I'm I'm always very happy to come back. I mean, I was very envious of, of course, the special effects. Uh, We didn't have a lot of, of, uh, you know, we were mainly down to green screen and and, uh, rather cumbersome rubber monsters. And so it's a thrill to, 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 you know, uh, be a part of that, the digital age. Um, But at the same time, uh, you know, I I went to visit when David Tennant first took over as a doctor uh, in 2006, I think it was, or seven. uh, um, uh, I went along to see the filming. 
and I was very pleased to see that the actual programme, although it looked much better with all the special effects on the screen, it was still made with the same degree of chaos and panic and nobody knew what the heck they were doing as it was when I made it. So nothing really ever changes, despite the technology. I suppose there's nothing new under the sun. And so chaos and confusion about how the show might continue. This has happened more than once, of course. And general production chaos has <laughs> happened many times more than once. So it's interesting to hear Peter Davison talk about that, especially as we move into what seems now, at least on the service, quite a smoother affair with this new RT Disney filming everything way in advance, second Russell era. Uh, it's interesting to think back to how the first RTD era worked, at least early on. I could believe that. With all the stuff floating around about the production difficulties of Series 1, but I think things evened out a lot and Bad Wolf still has all that talent. So hopefully it'll just be smooth sailing from here on out. One series a year, please. We'll get into this more later, but this liminal period we're in right now, we're talking in very early February 2023. It's so interesting, this kind of tension between some of us are really confident that RTD2 is going to be more of the same. Whether we think that's a good thing or a bad thing, we think this is going to be RTD's original 2000s run of Doctor Who come again. And others are really confident that this is going to be totally different or significantly different anyway. Look at the stuff RTD has done since Doctor Who. He's really changed as a writer and producer and he's done all sorts of different things and surely he's bringing that to the show. And then, of course, there are the more agnostic types who think it'll be a little bit the same and a little bit different, but we don't know right now. And I think that's a really interesting thing flavoring all these conversations. Would you guys agree? Yeah, I think it's all speculation. And I think uh, where you land on that uh, speculational question is going to basically be dependent on how you view RTD's different works and his various writings over the years. So it, I think everyone's going to have <laughs> their own interpretation, really. This ties into the generational conflict stuff we'll get into a lot pretty soon. But especially interesting, this vantage point right now is that other writers for RTD2 have yet to be announced for Series 14. So whether it's going to be some old hands, I'm fairly confident there'll be one old hand returning, uh, certainly. But whether it's going to be a lot of old hands, whether it's going to be some old hands, some new hands, whether it's going to be mostly new hands, whether it's going to pretty much just be Russell himself, like on the miniseries he writes a lot of these days, we don't know that yet. And that uncertainty also flavors lots of the conversations and conflicts going on right now, I think. Absolutely. The question of how new the new era is going to be, I think, in a lot of ways, is partially contingent on whether there'll be any new voices to speak of, I think, in the, in the writing room. Whereas, like, absent that, it's just a question of how much RTD has changed as a writer. So it's a question of how much will the show actually be able to evolve if it's just led by RTD or if it is able to actually somehow get new people into it, which I think the show has had maybe some trouble doing over the last decade or so. I definitely think RTD will be on the hunt for new writers and new talent to bring in, or at least I hope that'll be the case. Um, if it is just the same people, that's fine. But based on his interview comments that I know we'll get into, um, I'd be very surprised if he didn't make some effort to loop in voices we haven't heard before. Surely he wouldn't shutter out a spot for a young, fresh writer by rehiring someone who wrote more episodes of the show than anyone else. That would be disgusting. <laughs> what we're circling around here is an interview Russell T. Davis and Mark Gatiss did with The Times, The Sunday Times, uh, promoting Nolly, uh, which Gig and I and our friend Tyler recently chatted about. Uh, Russell's 2023 show about the, a queen losing a crown, as Russell and Gators like to characterize it. A soap star getting mysteriously sacked off her soap and all the interesting things emerging from that. So Russell and Mark Gators, who's in the show as an actor, have done a lot of interviews to promote Nolly. And Doctor Who comes up in a lot of them, as you'd expect. And this interview they gave to The Times is titled... Russell T. Davis and Mark Gatiss, How to Save TV. Television's smartest duo share a lifelong addiction to the small screen and their new show Nolly is an homage to the siren of the 1970s soap Crossroads. Characteristically humble, of course, you know, TV's smartest duo saving TV. <laughs> 
It ignited lots of interesting discussions in Doctor Who fandom, but I don't want to dive right into the article because I think the context of it is really interesting. And this might be something less to hand uh, for myself and for Nate, given that we're not English, but- I'm suddenly feeling the pressure. (laughs) The Times. Explain the Times to us as if we're foreigners. Um, All right. Well, in the UK, you have a range of um, sort of old media newspapers, and some of them, I guess, are kind of seen as lowbrow, sort of for the masses, or sensationalistic, and some of them are more posh, I guess you could say. And the posh ones also often have a very right-wing sort of bent. I think you could say The Times is one of those uh, posher newspapers, basically, one of those institutions that forms uh, part of the general British media bastion of the establishment. I would say it's it's not a particularly <laughs> it, it, it's it's not exactly the sort of outlet you would necessarily associate with RTD or at least how RTD likes to uh, present himself and how people like to think of RTD. So yeah, there's maybe been a bit of um, feathers ruffled over him talking to them. Well, okay, so you say when it's right wing, is that in the sense that all of these papers are generally right wing, or is it the sort of like tabloidy like? New York Post right wing. Um, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, in a sense, they're all basically on the, the scale of right wing to sort of very right wing. But I would say maybe there are sort of different phrasings of it. Like, on one hand, you have the sensationalistic sort of New York Post kind of like a sort of incredibly sensationalistic right wingism. And in here, over here, that would be like The Sun, for example, or The Daily Mail or whatever. Whereas The Times, I think, is like the telegraph and things like that they like to present themselves as i think a bit more classy about it i would say even though the sentiments the underlying sentiments aren't necessarily that different but i would say there is more um, a sort of quasi liberal acceptability to how it's framed in uh, outlets like the times even though they are probably promoting like the same underlying kind of economic uh, assumptions and politics and i would say they have just like posher columnists and stuff generally okay Got it. More more acceptable for people to read in Parliament, I assume. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's more of a kind of posh sort of newspaper, but advocates a kind of generally establishment politics, basically, in a way that has a sort of sheen of liberal acceptability, but is mainly sort of run by, you know, posh people. And it's not necessarily the sort of outlet that you would necessarily expect or imagine would just what RTD would be associated with, and it's certainly not what fans like to associate RTD with in their heads. So there have been some feathers ruffled over him talking to them, maybe. What I want to add to that is in 2019, actually, we'll circle around to this because it's to do with spin-offs, but in that interview with Paul Kirkley, where Russell talked about there should be the Nissa adventures and all that sort of thing, in this Paul Kirkley interview, Russell says something which I think flavors this Times interview we're soon going to discuss. And what he says is, he's talking about embracing the label of being a gay writer. This is all uh, contextualized by It's a Sin. The interview is mostly about that. The article reads, Incredible though it now seems, queer as folk and Russell's sexuality was wielded as a weapon by some tabloids when it was announced he would be bringing back Doctor Who, with The Sun headlining their story, Ducky Who, and The Telegraph claiming his appointment might alarm purists. So in Russell's words, You know, that industry is dying. It's lovely to see the slow death throes of those papers. And you never give them an interview. Whatever publicity comes along, The Sun, Daily Mail, Telegraph, Spectator, no. It makes life kind of simpler. Frankly, I wasn't surprised by those headlines. I've had a whole lifetime of that. And has it ever stopped me being commissioned? Has it ever stopped me writing what I want? Absolutely never. See, that's quite interesting. I would say he doesn't specifically include the times in that list, but I think he's generally giving enough of a wide uh, berth that you can sort of assume they're all factored in somewhere. I mean, he he notes in particular some explicitly hostile ones like The Sun and The Spectator, which are very on the nose about their evil. But um, he also includes The Telegraph, which is sort of one of those, again, posher, more acceptable, kind of (laughs) wishy-washy columnist kind of papers. So, yeah, the fact that he was openly kind of slagging off that whole industry back then, whereas now he's kind of doing the publicity circuit and, I guess, smoozing up with them, so to speak. It's, uh, yeah, interesting trajectory, you could say. If we go further back to a 2007 email exchange preserved in the Writer's Tale book. So, the context of this is Benjamin Cook and Russell T Davies are talking about leaks or discussion of series four 
before the fact, talking about whether more than one companion in Series 4 will confuse things, talking about Captain Jack's, quote, flamboyant sexuality as a, quote, disruptive axis. And Benjamin asks Russell, is the jury still out on whether interviews with the Daily Mail are a good idea, Russell? Didn't your boyfriend tell you that he'd rather you didn't grant them interviews? I think I agree with him on this one. <laughs> also, just the exchange before this, Russell said to Benjamin Cook, Hey, I had the bloody mail today describing me as having a large, soft, expressive face. How bloody sexy do I feel? Soft. And so then Benjamin negatively pushes back on the mail a little bit. And then Russell's response is, Far worse was the article's description of Martha as, quote, always going to be second best to Rose, followed immediately by a quote from me, making it sound as if I'd said second best. I'm still waiting to find out if Freema has seen that. I had a feeling that journalist was going to be dodgy, but I went ahead with it anyway. Why? Well, in the end, it's two pages in the Daily Mail. A great big photo of David and Kylie, a reminder that it's transmitted on Christmas Day, They printed the wrong time, of course, twice. And that's what matters. Harsh but true. It's publicity. Moreover, that's two pages on me and my success as a gay man in a paper that vilifies homosexuality. Visibility is a good way of changing things, and that'll do me. As long as you don't get paid by them, I'd never accept that. So that is interesting. So it's not necessarily just, um, it feels like more of a a parabolic kind of arc. So he's gone from, okay, I will engage with the horrible right-wing media, to, no, I won't to maybe sort of halfway in the middle. Because I would say today, him engaging with the Times isn't the same as him engaging with the Daily Mail. Because um, the Daily Mail is sort of, I would say, it's in the sort of in the middle between the tabloid and the posh papers, but it is very overtly on the hostile right wing kind of fucked up scale. Like yeah, I would say the Daily Mail, like the Sun, has a really like toxic rep. So it's he's not quite on the level of, I will engage with the Daily Mail. But he is nonetheless engaging with that industry and with this that whole coterie of kind of uh, fancy papers. Understanding that context really colors what he said in the actual interview, I think. Um, you know, knowing that it is kind of a posh right wing newspaper, right? One that is still, you know, it's kind of dressed up in a way that is acceptable to the liberals, to the capitalistic society, and yet you know, it still has the same angle as all the rest at the core of it with RTD saying, okay, yes, I will talk with them. Well, I don't want to get too political. I mean, obviously he's phenomenal for representation, but I wonder if there is a small aspect of doing it in a way that's acceptable to, you know, that, that audience, right? I, I, I want to be very careful here. Uh, I, I don't want anyone yelling at me on Twitter, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. I don't want to get too political is my constant refrain. I actually picked it up from Doctor Who producer Alex Mercer, who worked on series 11 and series 12, and who said that very phrase uh, in the commentary track for Rosa, which Gig and I and our friend Oliver uh, recently chatted about. So Yes, yeah, a famously non-political episode. <laughs> And a famously apolitical paper that we're about to read out from. (laughs) So, The Times. This article, the opening of it is pretty dramatic. It opens with, It's supposed to be a golden age, but British broadcasters are struggling. While ITV begins the long trek to become a streaming service, the BBC is hard up and under political attack, and Channel 4 survives as a public broadcaster, but without sufficient cash to compete. Right in the middle of all this sit Russell T. Davis and Mark Gatiss, mainstream mavericks with a track record of creating prime time hits. In about 90 minutes, they solve most of television's problems. Over lunch, Davis explains how he would pep up early evening viewing on the BBC, outlines a new vision for Doctor Who as its 60th birthday nears, and explains why angry new writers aren't creating great shows. Oh, and he and Gators still find time to talk about Nolly, their first collaboration, a powerful witty drama, and so on, so on. Yes, credit must be given to the framing that I think, you know, any sort of journalistic assessment of an interview is going to do. It continues, and so in short order, Davis conjures up solutions. Let's start with BBC One's ailing four times a week soap EastEnders, 
and its often predictable pre-watershed offerings of endless pregnancy scandals, divorce. What would Davis do? Quote, Reduce EastEnders to three episodes a week and you've created 100 spots of television a year. I'd use those to give EastEnders writers inventive teams who have created enough divorces and chases and drugs and murders to write sitcoms and come up with game shows. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting idea. I mean, I'd say it indicates a willingness to take these writers who he feels are having their talents wasted and give them opportunities to create their own things, basically. To actually, you know, liven up the, the, the landscape of this channel with new stuff. So I think that, that probably um, adds some context to what he goes on to say a bit later. But uh, yeah, probably shouldn't be overlooked. The article continues. Then there's Doctor Who, a show that Davis triumphantly restored to the nation's affections 18 years ago, but whose hold on younger viewers began to loosen recently. A lifelong fan, he has been brought back as showrunner. What does he want to do? Quote, you make all of the back catalogue available first on iPlayer. Yes. I can't swear that will happen, but there are contracts. It's our heritage. It deserves to be there so kids can fall in love with Doctor Who like they love Friends. Sidebar, he means the television show Friends. Not their actual friends. Of which they have none, of course. (laughs) We've got Doctor Who Friends. It it can be done. (laughs) Uh, He he continues, The reason I spun out Tortured and the Sarah Jane Adventures first time round was to keep the channel controllers interested in Doctor Who. It's a brand, a franchise, end quote. Nate, what are your thoughts here? That sounds wonderful to me. Something that I've been thinking about is just the sheer volume of the Doctor Who universe so far and how that would look just on a streaming service if it was all in one place. That's kind of like the, you know, regardless of whatever happens in the future, that is like the, you know, the The dream, the ideal, the... Yeah, yes. That is the dream um, for me as a Doctor Who fan right now. Like, just the idea of having a single streaming service where, you know, ideally one I already pay for, where I can already see the new series, the classic series, Torchwood, Sarah Jane Adventures, even Class, all in the same place. I'm not saying that's what's coming, but if that is what's coming, I that would be enough for me, right? Like if if that's what the Disney Plus collaboration gave us, they've they've earned it. Can we get the Caldor City audios on Disney Plus somehow as well? Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? Yeah, you know, I've I have some mock-ups actually of um what a faction paradox tile would look like on Disney Plus. So, <laughs> I'm not saying it's happening, but yeah, I I feel like a huge, huge, huge strength of Doctor Who. And it's something that was understated. This is the opposite of a criticism, but it was understated in Russell T. Davis' first era of Doctor Who. A huge strength of Doctor Who, the brand, the franchise, as he calls it, is it's bloody huge. It's been around forever. There is so much of it. Not all of it's great, but a fair bit of it is. And there's a lot of it, no matter how you slice it. It's all there. Classic Who and Torchwood, and the Sarah Jane Adventures. And if you want to get weirder and wackier than that, like Nate and myself do, that's there as well. The th- Classic Who was produced. The money went into that. The effort went into that. It didn't. It, it shouldn't just shudder away like they thought of it back in the day. Hence, you know, episodes getting destroyed and not preserved and everything. But you look at the success of the home media releases of Classic Who. You look at the success of something like the Twitch marathon of Classic Who. You look at how many copies of those collection Blu-rays sell, restoring and tweaking old Classic Who episodes and special features. It is extremely significant. They sell so much. People are so interested in them. And not just old people. That's why that's, That sounds unkind. Not just people of a more aged disposition. <laughs> and, not just, and not just freaks like us who can happily watch you know, hours and hours of 60s television reconstructions, you know, over stills for for a day. There's a lot of people that are interested in this stuff. And I think rightfully so. A lot of it is really good. And when it's not good, it's often still interesting. So when he calls it our heritage, I totally am in sync with what he's saying. I think, and maybe this is part of Disney's interest in the show on their streaming service is you don't just want the new stuff which I believe is all they're going to have access to right away. 
But to have like a 26 season show in your catalog, that is really, really good. That is so much stuff for people to engage with. To have these spinoffs there is, it's, it's just content upon content upon content. And most of it's interesting and some of it's good. I think it's a fantastic thing. The idea of having it all centralized, you know, I'm not, as an Australian, I'm not happy with the show going to Disney in that our Frida Air service, which has supported the show forever, won't get it anymore. And I don't really want to get Disney Plus. But the benefit of something like that, I mean, it didn't have to happen on Disney. It could have happened other places. But the benefit of that, yeah, I think is really clear. And it sounds like a nice dream whether or not it could actually be feasibly achieved. Gig, what do you think of all this stuff? Um, yeah, I like the idea of uh, Classic Who being all bingeable in one place. I think there's a lot of a real uh, solid appeal for that. I think it's a it's one of those ideas that is just self-evidently obvious and a good idea. It just has to be worked out whether it can uh, happen. I um I think his comment about why he made the spin-offs is kind of interesting in its own way because it's almost like rather than saying, "Oh, I wanted to beautifully expand the world of who and give new people a chance to follow their dreams you know he's just saying i wanted to keep the the commissioners interested and that is an interesting in in its own way i guess maybe it by keeping them interested me he maybe he means demonstrating that doctor who as a franchise could support more things and become more essential by growing out these different demographics and audiences and i, I think the more um the more spin-offs you have going the bigger a thing the Doctor Who empire, uh, so to speak, becomes. And I guess the more essential it becomes, the more weight it starts to carry. I think also, like in these functional terms, there's something to be said for the longevity of the franchise that can be accomplished through spin-offs. There'll be more willingness to take chances, I think, in the spin-offs compared to the Mothership show. Torchwood changed format a lot. Uh, and you know, that, that did graduate. It eventually was a co-production in America, which... I think this is important because Torch would often get seen as a failure because Russell T. Davis went back to the UK because his late husband, unfortunately, um, got very ill. Uh, people act like Miracle Day got cancelled and like it was really bad and so it did really bad, but it didn't. It did fine and stars were going to make more with Russell. It was all going to go ahead, but he had to go back to the UK because, you know, of a personal issue because of his partner. I feel like that over time has been corrupted into this idea of like the spin-offs did poorly but both spin-offs ended because of reasons kind of outside their own control elizabeth sladen unfortunately got sick herself and you know tragically passed away and that's why the sarah jane adventures ended after his husband got sick and that's effectively why torchwood didn't keep going uh in the united states so i feel like that combined with the fact that the reason we didn't get more spin-offs after that wasn't because they were a bad idea or nobody wanted to do them it was because the budgets got frozen with the BBC because of the worldwide recession. There was no money to keep making them or there was no willingness to put that money into making more of them. All these issues, I feel like, get forgotten and we just kind of get this weird, hazy idea of why there were no more spin-offs or something. Would you guys agree? Careful. I think you're at risk of getting political there by bringing in the actual <laughs> context of the real world economic crisis and <laughs> actual factors. People always go, oh, Moffat had so much more money to make Series 5. No, he didn't. He had less money. You can read about it. This isn't a conspiracy. It was all very solid stuff that happened because there was a huge recession in 2008. And when we did eventually get a spin-off, it was an online-only sort of thing on the BBC Three. And I guess that was the only spin-off to actually get cancelled due to its own failures <laughs> rather than because of a personal tragedy. Even that, if they had just... If they'd given it a better platform, I think it could have turned out very differently for class. But as it is, people just weren't ready to make the jump to like a streaming only show on the BBC's own. Yeah. And the promotion was weird and it didn't really have the power behind it that, you know, a huge vision like Davis had. And I never think it had quite the uh, clarity of purpose or the creative unity that even in its ropier days, Torchwood basically had and the Sarah Jane Adventures always had. I think, yeah. Anyway, we'll talk about class itself one day. I think it's interesting that here already we see uh, Russell kind of slipping into a cynical mode of talking about television, you know, in terms of the audience and the getting the controllers invested. Like, it's very analytical. And he's right that spinoffs do work in that way, you know, like bringing in, growing the brand, getting more people involved. I was recently kind of shocked to hear, um, it was an interview he did on the Out of the Broom Cupboard podcast, and he said many interesting things, but the host, uh, Chris Johnson, said that, uh, like, he, he complimented Russell on the Sarah Jane Adventures, 
and said that when Doctor Who had stopped being cool, um, he still went back and watched the Sarah Jane adventures. And I was kind of like, oh, wow, that's like, you know, that that's an anecdote right there. You know, that's that's evidence that's the spinoffs working as intended. And even when he mentions this thing about Emmerdale, um, that's very much the same. I mean, when I first read that line, I was kind of skimming admittedly. And I thought that he was suggesting that there be some like Emmerdale expanded universe, right? Oh, get all those writers to do their own pilots of sitcoms. And yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see if he brings such a, such an attitude to, um, his new season of Doctor Who. He's a great pragmatist of TV. He's very pragmatic in his views. I wouldn't be shocked if a lot of the episodes in the upcoming series well, it'll be 14, 15, um, if a lot of the episodes kind of work as backdoor pilots for potential spinoffs. It's a really interesting point, that kind of variance of tone. And I think, yeah, it ties into audience appeal and longevity and all those sorts of things. It reminds me, when I was a youngster, I stopped watching Doctor Who. I stopped watching Russell T. Davis' Doctor Who after a certain episode, which I, I disliked to the extent that I just threw up my hands and said, I'm not doing this anymore. But what I kept doing was Torchwood. Because I really like Torchwood. And Torchwood wasn't Doctor Who. It's connected to Doctor Who, but it's its own thing. I kept watching Torchwood. And listening to uh, some Eighth Doctor audios, I kept doing that. Throughout the years, I didn't actually pick up the show again until the uh, whole John Hurt thing on YouTube. That end of the name of the Doctor thing uh, fired me up. And that's what made me go back and rewatch the first three series and go through all the other series. And, you know, I've been running ever since. But yeah... A spin-off going, it lets you keep an audience that might drop out of, you know, one of the shows for whatever reason, it not being cool enough or them disliking how it's going or something or just the audience appeal kind of shifting. That's a good point. The uh, the expanse of the empire can be a really ensnaring thing. Like a net to catch the strays that, <laughs> that wander away. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keeping you kind of in the sphere and maybe the mothership will win you back one day. Interesting use of mothership given uh, <laughs> one of the things we will be talking about later. Mothership. Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, we're at the big bit of the interview now. This is the this is the crown jewel. Feels too complimentary. This is the... What's that Star Wars line? The spark that lights the fire. It's that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are going to take this seriously. We're going to talk a lot about this because there's so much to unpack here slowly. So, the article reads, And what about finding a new generation of TV writers? Davis thinks too many recent recruits are just too angry. Quote, I do a lot of mentoring and there are voices wanting to be heard of any gender or ethnicity who consider themselves invisible. They hate the media that ignores them and they're trapped into wanting a job in that medium purely to increase representation. I read their scripts and they're rubbish. They don't actually love television, so they don't know how to write for it. End Russell quote, start Gators quote. I'm so glad you said that. Sometimes I think I'm like Pollyanna because I've met so many people over the years who hate making television. It seems to make them so miserable. Go and work on the bins or something. It's hard work. It gives you ulcers, so you have to love it. And then they go on talking about how they love TV so much and they tie this into their gayness. And it's all, it's the quotes we discussed in the Nolly uh, discussion, actually. Interesting mention of the bins there. I hadn't picked up on that before. <laughs> that, feels, that feels coded in some ways. Yeah. There's so much here. Where to begin? Yeah, it's tricky. I think that if we, if we accept their premise that there are people like that who do exist, right, then... Obviously, you know, I think that the point they're trying to make, which is that you need to love television in order to get involved with it, right? It really kind of needs to be a passion project. You need to, you know, really love the ideas you're bringing to the table, etc. That's objectionable. I think the, the hard part is accepting their premise that there are uh, people like that, you know, who are so concerned about I, I don't know. It kind of speaks to me as him maybe projecting a little bit or saying, oh, someone someone cares about representation and maybe they're not a good writer, therefore they don't have any love for television. Or maybe it's the other way around. There, there's some messy concepts that are getting overlapped here in a way that is hard to um, 
to interpret. I think that there's a charitable interpretation, but um, whether you can get there without some uh, fairly, I guess, to to a lot of people, very offensive um, assumptions. That's the hard part. Yeah, overlapped is how I put it. I think he's looping together several things which maybe don't need to be looped together. Yeah, I think what happens is a lot of us see one part of this quote and we latch onto it and we kind of just focus on that, whether it's agreeing with the there are TV writers who hate television, that there is a lot of television these days, which to me absolutely feels like it's being written by people who just don't like television. They don't like the format. They, they're in television for whatever reason. Maybe it's the only form they could get something commissioned in in the streaming boom or whatever. But I don't get any sense that they actually like television or maybe they don't even watch it so much like RTD often grumbles about. When someone loves television, I think it's pretty screamingly obvious. Ryan Johnson's new show is just bursting with love of the medium and embrace of the specific things to do with the medium. But there's so many Netflix shows I watch and I'm like, this is a fucking movie, but you've just blobbed it out in this bizarre way. And it's just this awful squelchy mass of a, it's a pilot stretched to eight hours and it's just gross and it doesn't feel like it has any joy in being this specific format of television. And then you look at something like uh, Damon Lindelof's shows, which clearly are just they're, they're, they've got goosebumps raising up on their skin in the sheer joy they have in, in being the format of a weekly TV show. I totally get what he's saying there. But what I'm doing is I'm looking at a really specific part of that quote and I'm divorcing it from its very vital context and I'm going, yeah, you know, to one bit of it. And other people are doing the exact same thing, I think, where they're looking at one specific bit of the quote and they're going, yeah or nah, to one specific bit of it. And we're both just kind of lasering in on specific bits of the quote, whereas he's actually made quite a convoluted and perhaps confusing larger statement in here, which like Gig and Nate say, is ensnaring several things together. The gender thing, the race thing. So he's saying specifically, he's not saying how I'm taking it in that there are TV writers who don't like TV and that's annoying. He's saying there are people of any gender and ethnicity who hate the media that ignores them and they're trapped into wanting a job in that medium purely to increase representation. So he's saying there are like women writers or there are black writers who want to increase representation in TV. So they write TV episodes and they hate TV. And I guess the implication is more than my kind of format-based thing of they don't like how TV works. It's the they don't like TV because they're not represented in TV. So they're going into TV to increase representation, but they resent TV because there's not enough representation. And t- there's so much implication and suggestion here. I feel like I'm getting lost what he's actually saying and who these writers are. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Conf- his premise there that of people being trapped into wanting a job purely to increase representation. I, I I'm skeptical of that characterization. I, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> like you know, I'd say usually people who want a job in television want a job in television I, I, and I feel like yeah. you know that may, presumably because maybe they're, they're fans of television or they watch television they, or maybe they have glamorous ideas of what making television is like or I, I just feel like he's sort of um, you know two of the things he's looped together are this idea of people critiquing the exclusion or the marginalisation of different voices in the TV industry with you know people who uh, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's it's just really a, bit, a really bit of a puzzling construct he's put together there, and I think he's then looped that in with the crap scripts he reads from people he's mentoring, and and you know they may be crap for all kinds of reasons. I would say presumably because they're from inexperienced writers who don't have the, you know the, the the fundamentals, haven't built up the skills, don't have the experience, haven't you know, learned how to do this, that, and the other, and he's you know lumping these all together and saying okay well i guess these scripts are bad because these people hate television because they've been excluded by it and that's the only reason they want a job in television in the first place and i think the ending point is just it's a little bit nonsensical i think to me and i think i think people are understandably reading this quote and thinking like what the hell this guy he's gone some kind of anti-woke screed <laughs> he's accusing marginalized voices of blooming all, all kinds of things and i think another kind of unfortunate implication it sounds like he's saying, if you're angry about racism or sexism, whatever, then you can't write good television. And the framing of his quote by the Times kind of enhances that because it's saying, yeah. oh, he thinks young writers are just too angry. You know, you know RCTE doesn't explicitly say those words in his quote, but that's kind of the almost a subtext of the quote almost, or at least something you can draw from the quote. So it's quite unfortunate on the whole. It's like he's stepped into 
a kind of landmine of discourse here and he's acting like his mate Stephen Moffat in, you know, how far can I extend the foot into my mouth? How much can I get people to read me in bad faith? But, you know, as our friend Tyler simmered about in our Nolly podcast, you've got to take people at their word. <laughs> when Russell has specific words in specific orders and he's not saying the article's misrepresented the actual words, they're not misquoting him or anything, We, you can't give him too much leeway. You can give him leeway in the article's own words, but, and you know, oh, they might have cut this bit out. Of course, of course, they talked for 90 minutes, but he did say that weird convoluted statement there. So, it's entirely fair to judge it. I think what a lot of people are doing positively and negatively is imposing a more logical narrative onto what he said, whether it's like a anti-woke type one that Russell hates young woke writers because they're just trying to bring the wokeness into TV, you know, based RTD. He's actually our guy, whether it's that or whether it's my initial thing of like going, oh yeah, writers that don't like TV, that totally happens. But he doesn't say what I'm saying. You know, he, he doesn't actually talk about, I think even speaking in a generational conflict kind of way, the idea of there are young writers who don't like TV. They haven't watched their Columbo. They don't get it. They don't know. They don't, they don't know how to do episodic scripts. They need to watch Mad Men and get, you know, TV is short stories. There are young, they don't understand this because they just watch the Netflixes and they just watch the streaming blobs. He doesn't say any of that. That would make perfect sense if he said that because that's generational conflict. Young writers having issues with writing TV, you know, issues he gets in his mentoring, but he doesn't say anything like that. And no, nor does he really say that young writers are way too woke and crap because they're too woke. He says this weird convolution statement of th there are writers who think they're invisible and they hate the media that ignores them and they want to be in that media to increase purely to increase representation purely is a is a dodgy bit isn't it purely yeah i think there are a lot of people who a lot of like younger artists writers whatever who are actually really energized by the idea that they could yeah. you know represent you know themselves or something that they don't see in the media by bringing it in and actually doing it themselves and that can be very galvanizing for them and you know they might be an experience they might make something that's crap but like it's not a sense of being trapped into only wanting a job out of to, to hit some arbitrary quota you know it's wanting to do this because you feel it can be done and it should be done and it really excites and interests you it's not necessarily a trap it's not some horrible thing. I think RTD's framing seems to come from almost a sense of woundedness. Uh, oh my God, these young writers, they, they hate TV. Poor TV. Oh my God, how can they hate this wonderful thing I love so much? And kind of turning this, I think, quite understandable maybe grievance or resentment that a lot of marginalized kind of writers or voices kind of have into some like attack on tv that must be defended against and oh my god this injustice against poor wounded television industry i think the maybe the maximally uncharitable interpretation of what he's saying isn't just that it's not that he's being anti-woke or anything like that it's specifically that he's looking at these new writers who aren't having to go through the same struggles that he faced you know going back to what i said earlier about how you could even say that he's managed his career in a way that him being gay and again you know this is like the maximally uncharitable opinion this isn't necessarily the one i hold but of him saying that, okay, they're not having to uh, shape themselves in the same way that I had to shape myself to get accepted, and that therefore there's something, you know, and, and that there's some resentment because of that. It's like the pulling up the ladder from the youth trying to... Exactly. And it's, um, it's difficult because I know that, well, I, I definitely feel like this was the first draft of a hot take. He was sitting there chit-chatting <laughs> with his buddy, Mark Gatiss, right? Who just made it so much worse. <laughs> they were just, um, just chit-chatting and kind of going off each other. And it's hard for me to tell whether this was even a direct response to the interviewer or if it's just something that he said in conversation with his friend. It's, it's hard. It constructs this image of... Uh, these old mainstays of Doctor Who, uh, Russell and Mark, swatting away the hands of young writers, swatting them away from the Doctor Who table and <laughs> literally shoving them out to the bins. This is where you belong. <laughs> <laughs> Keep watching Classic Who until you love it and then maybe we'll grant you a uh, a short trip. But until then, the bin's with you. It's <laughs> so I do understand the uh, consternation. Uh, to put it lightly, that some people had over this <laughs> because 
It really does read that way. And of course, you can bring in the larger context, like this very article, like literally that quote is talking about him mentoring others. And it's one of those things, I think, especially with someone like Russell, it's a look at what monkey does, look at what monkey says kind of contrast. Like with the whole David Tennant can't be in a woman's clothes debacle we talked about in an earlier RTD2 chat. It's one of those things where, yeah, you can read some of his comments in ways that look like the, well, you know, you can read some of his comments in ways that he's uh, conforming to uh, heteronormativity we might find distasteful and, uh, you know, people found it transphobic and whatnot to some extent. Some people did, some people didn't. And you look at what he's doing tangibly in the actual show, you know, he's casting a trans actress is one of the first press releases about his era who's been cast in a prominent role and we'll see how prominent they are in the episodes. But, you know, it's a kind of, you look at what they do and look at what they say. It's very much with Moffat as well because they're going to say some shit, but they're going to do some stuff as well. And I lean towards the actions being more important ultimately than how they speak, but they are writers, so it is fair to hold them to account quite a bit for what they say. Yes, I think with writers, we're always, um, I think us, the audience, are always kind of looking for the subtext and things they say and trying to identify what's going on in their brains, maybe, <laughs> because then we can predict the spoilers for the next Doctor Who episodes or some <laughs> bullshit like that. I, 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 never, I never want to have it like, the last thing I think should ever happen is, hey, there's a trans actress in Doctor Who, so shut down all the conversations about Russell might have done something slightly bigoted or Russell might have said something a bit wonky, let's talk about that. Fuck all that, because he cast a trans actress. You've got to stop all that shit. He's a good guy. Stop these insinuations. He's a bad guy. And we want to do the opposite of that. That's why we've been talking 15 minutes about, you know, this, this interview. We want to, you, you want to talk about this, because it's, it's all complex issues and everything. I never want the, um, he did an action, so cut out the chat. But I think you want to look at the larger whole, of course, which part of it is actions, part of it is discourse. Some is good, some is bad. There's a whole larger thing going on here, always. Yeah, these people are complicated, and that's probably part of why they're interesting writers to begin with. Well, well, RTD, I don't know if I'd say the same about Gatiss, but uh, RTD, certainly. Something to bring in now while we're still circling around this quote is RTD critiquing other TV writers or complimenting other TV writers. I think it's worth bringing in some more of that. This gets returned to a lot because it's really interesting. In 2021, Russell, of course, spoke out against that Disney Plus Loki TV show. He was talking about how TV drama commissioners want gay stories before he spoke out against the rise of streaming services. Uh, this is the phrasing from the Pink News article. RTD says, I think huge cleaning warning bells are ringing as the giants rise up with Netflix and Disney Plus. <laughs> Especially. I think that's a very great worry. Loki makes one reference to being bisexual once and everyone's like, oh my God, it's like a pansexual show. It's like one word. He said the word prince and we're meant to go, thank you, Disney, aren't you marvellous? It's a ridiculous, craven, feeble gesture towards the vital politics and the stories that should be told. And that, well, the article says, Davis added that his worry about the future of LGBT plus stories on TV is that streaming services will, quote, damn us with, quote, their condescension in the end. So that's Russell being pretty open about like a, a, a political, a socially minded aspect of a TV show. <laughs> And specifically situating it within discourse around Disney+, Plus, which is so interesting. That's one example of him critiquing other television. There's another example of him critiquing other television that I think is more on the functional end that I think is really interesting. It's a clip from the um, 2008 screen wipe with Charlie Brooker, who's like asking him questions about TV. Bad dialogue is, is like 90%, 95% of television. And most television dialogue is just really functional and talks about the plot and ping pongs. It's like you're, you're absolutely in trouble when people are actually, this sounds weird, but when they're actually talking to each other. Where they go, what are you doing here? I'm doing this. Why? Oh, because I did this. Oh, who said so? He did. Why? That's just rubbish. That's just explaining the plot. It's just filling two pages, actually. I saw a drama once that, that I won't name, but it, its opening line of dialogue was, happy wedding day, sis. Like, wedding? Sister? Right, got it. It's like, ouch! And who calls their sister sis? It's like, you know, it doesn't exist. It's, and you shouldn't write like that. You, you, you're giving up all responsibility if you start, if you... You know, it's like you are faced with those scenes where you've got to say that someone's their father or someone's brother to this character. And you must not 
right dialogue that says, well, you would say that, being my brother. You know, that's, that's so often you hear that on telly, and you're just doing a bad job if you're doing that. And I know why people do it, because they're sitting there going, how can I explain this is the brother? You've just got to write it better. Or you've just got to... There's a great phrase that Jimmy McGovern uses that he says, I would rather be confused for ten minutes than bored for five seconds. In good dialogue, they're not really listening to each other. It's like that great phrase, which is that the, the opposite of listening is waiting because you're just waiting to say your next thing. And that's everyone in life all the time. People hardly ever listen to each other. It's like when you're writing dialogue, it's actually two monologues that just connect sometimes. A good dialogue just bristles and sounds like two people in a room instead of a page of dialogue going chunk, 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 like that. I don't know, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I wasn't listening, obviously. I was thinking of my next <laughs> question. <laughs> what, whatever, yeah, what, yeah, that made sense. And sometimes there are really functional things like plot exposition, especially something like Doctor Who, where it has to be more functional than anything else. We've got to say, this computer has this function and does that. But, but then you just get that over with. It's like then you've got the Doctor to just come in and say those things. We've got two examples there of RTD critiquing writing, critiquing scripts. One of them is very... Uh, like functional, like actual issues he sees in the actual craft of writing. And the other is a more socially minded issue of like larger tied into politics around companies and Disney specifically kind of weak representation. Do you guys see this interfacing with RTD's thoughts on crap scripts and rubbish (laughs) young writers and that sort of thing? I think that quote about the Loki thing is quite relevant in that it stresses that RTD has a real interest in amending you know the 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 lack of representation you know the, the very thing that he kind of slightly goes after younger writers for um, wanting to do now you know he himself is very like advocating of that view and i think i guess there is probably like a sympathy to the younger writers in the times quote because he says that he he describes them as trapped into wanting a thing so it implies almost like it's not their fault or whatever i mean but but nonetheless he he believes in this idea that these are vital stories that need to be told and vital politics and that just doing it in a really half-assed kind of like sort of bitty way where you just throw in a little slight insinuation of someone possibly being queer and you know that's not enough like he completely sympathizes and passionately like agrees with that view so you know you can't exactly paint him as the opposite of that also what he has to say about dialogue in television uh, <laughs> it rings so true i've seen so much television which does exactly what he's talking about and it's just excruciating so maybe he has a mm, well is it even an overreaction rtd consumes an incredible amount of television much more so than a lot of other writers, let alone viewers. He watches loads of things, as he talks about a lot. And so he has a, I would say he has a good sense of the totality of television, especially British television. And so for him to be exacting is what you want. You want that. But it's all tied up into, yeah, the way he's, the, it's not just the way he's phrased it. What he's saying in the Times article is it's rubbish because of kind of the representation motivation. So I don't think we can just charitably read it in terms of, oh, the craft of writing isn't up to scratch in that, even though, of course, that is something he cares about and ha- hammers people on. See, the screen white clip, um, he's talking about TV that you know, he's watched and seen, right? So in a sense, that stuff that is actually getting produced and making it to screen professionally still suffers from this basic, like, schoolboy errors, you know, the, the, this lack of the fundamentals. So, you know, imagine, like, how annoyed he must be, you know, mentoring these people and seeing the same mistakes that actually get to screen, kind of uh, yeah I, f- I feel like this must be like some sort of existential thing that he's been trying to grapple with like how why do people write this way what's missing how can i like somehow stop these people from going down the dark path where they end up turning out this crap television but you know the answers he uh, arrives at are not necessarily accurate ones is the main thing and you know his his position as this kind of older kind of established figure of television is gonna play a role in that you know he's not necessarily as in tune with the kids as maybe you know everyone might like to think i appreciate this clip because it sort of contextualizes for me what he means by a bad script right like when he says that they're you know i read their scripts and they're rubbish um okay like are they are they extremely rubbish or are they the kind of extremely rubbish that still manages to make it on most tv networks um, you know, that, that's, it's interesting because when I read that quote, I was very much like, oh, he's saying that they're just never going to have a chance. Whereas this interview clip proves that 
rubbish writers have a chance all the time. That's yeah, that's interesting. He brings up Jimmy McGovern, who created numerous shows, uh, but most good, uh, most importantly, is Cracker, the show with Robbie Coltrane as like the crime psychologist, which our friend Tyler is a huge fan of. Cracker got produced, you know, it had plenty of episodes, but Game of Thrones also got produced and was much more successful. And the first episode of Game of Thrones, uh, not the unseen pilot, but the one we got, partly because of the failure of the unseen pilot, is full of lines like, uh, hello, sister. <laughs> you know, the viewers need to know we're siblings because that's very, imp- that's very important. So, hello, sister. Uh, <laughs> how's the incest going lately? You know, it's full of that kind of dialogue. And it, I mean, it worked. So, what we're talking about with RTD's metrics for writing are a kind of wispy thing in that it is important. And I care about what he's saying a lot. But how important is it? Because a lot of this television with really bad dialogue does really well, does incredibly well. And a lot of viewers, I think, kind of speak to the opposite of that Jimmy McGovern quote. A lot of viewers would prefer to not be confused at all, even if that means crap dialogue. And so, what defines crap writing in the end? (laughs) You know, if we're getting into much bigger discussions there that we won't really get into, but you see what I mean. So, RTD's thing about wanting what he sees, and I agree with him, is good dialogue, is a kind of wispy idea, isn't it? Because I can see some young people kind of smarting at that and thinking, well, who are you to say that? Because plenty of Doctor Who is crap and plenty of Doctor Who is crap dialogue. And some of the greatest or the most successful shows in the world have terrible dialogue. Why are you swatting me away to the bins because I have dialogue on parody with that? Like what's actually going on here? So I kind of, I think that complicates things as well. I agree with Jimmy McGovern and Davis, but I kind of get why some people would not. Yeah, not everyone's standards are the same. And when RCD talks about someone not knowing how to write for television, you know, that I, I think like there there are subjectivities to, to that standard. I, I think um, you know someone who writes something that I mean, yeah I don't really have anything to add. There. <laughs> Basically, you pretty much summed it up. <laughs> there's a, there's another piece of the puzzle I want to insert here, which is from the writer's tale, and it's an email that RTD sent to the co-creator of the Skins television show, Brian Elsley. Skins, how would we characterise Skins? say a very youthful drama about very youthful youth (laughs) so i'm not reading out the whole email but it's rtd is effusing about skins basically he's saying it's phenomenal and that he bloody loves it especially the second series and one of the bits of the email goes like this rtd says i'm going to sound like a stalker soon so i'll stop in a minute but also i think everything you've done with that young writers team is wonderful and shames the rest of us. I read an interview with you years ago in the Sunday Times, I think, where you spoke about new forms of narrative, how our TV watching generation is becoming outdated, and the next generation will have new ways of storytelling. I just nodded sadly, but then you went out and did something about it. You're an inspiration. And then Brian replies, and he's you know happy and he's flattered and everything, and one of the things he says is, Next year on Skins, on Series 3, we're kind of pushing it out. All the writers except me are under 23, and four of them under the age of 20. All the characters are gone to be completely replaced with a set born from the imaginations of the young creative team. And then he invites them to the writer's room and says you should check it out. Uh, We would be really happy for you to check it out, or just to meet in general. Yeah, I I feel like this exchange is really relevant. Uh, to all the topics flying around here. Would you guys agree? Yeah, although I feel there is something conspicuously quite different in that here we see RTD effusing about the idea of young writers, new generations, sort of new people, new talent. Whereas in this new Times quote from this year, he kind of specifically lays in on um, people feeling invisible due to gender, ethnicity. It's like a slightly different conception of what's being represented and what need is being uh, filled here. I, I almost feel like it is probably reflective of how maybe the general public conversation around representation has changed since you know the 2000s. I feel like there, I feel like you wouldn't necessarily be uh, likely to hear RTD talking about you know I don't know gender or ethnicity or race or whatever and kind of things like that, all the the woke stuff or whatever in the 2000s, whereas 
as as you would to hear him talk about it today. You see where I'm, you see where I'm coming from. I feel like now there is an element of you know different types of identity you know, in his new comments, and I think there is a pointedness to those which maybe doesn't exist when it comes to like just younger writers. You know, and I feel like maybe the sore point with the new comments is that it's specifically about being marginalised on the basis of who you are, not just you know on the basis of like, being like, young and like inexperienced. I, I have no idea about the Skins writing team, so you know that could be completely off base. But like I think, you know, in in terms of if we're characterising RTD as like the the sort of the big the big reactionary chud here, <laughs> then I think that that would be how you fit the Skins quote in, in the sense that the Skins stuff doesn't quite address the same issues that the current conversation you know, with the Times is kind of uh, pointing to. I'd be tempted by that reading, if not for the fact that I've also seen his follow up. I would say kind of like. Uh, PR uh, comments to the independent, which very much are like very explicit in what he means by that. Yeah. We'll get into that. Yeah. We'll get into the uh, kind of s- sequel. Oh, spoilers. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sequel article in a second. The last thing I want to talk about on this Times topic is when we talked about generational conflicts, there's a kind of addition to that I want to discuss, which is. <sighs> With Doki Hu, and I'm using that phrasing <laughs> specifically for a good reason. With Doki Hu, a lot of people want to write it. A lot of young people really, really want to write it, which is normal and good and healthy. Makes total sense. I think tons of Doctor Who fans have probably got ratting in their brains somewhere, rustling around is you know their idea of well, if I was running it. This is what I'd do. This would be my first season. This would be my doctor. I think that's a very common thing for lots of fans to have. A lot of young people really want to write Doctor Who. A lot of people in general, including the elderly, want to write Doctor Who and the middle-aged. Lots of people want to write Doctor Who because there are lots of fans of it. And as fans of it, a lot of us feel a kind of ownership or co-ownership of Doctor Who. And I think, I know this is a loaded term. I think a lot of fans feel entitled to writing Doctor Who uh, for various reasons. And you kind of see this emanate in... The thing is, the way a lot of these writers got onto Doctor Who wasn't by wishing so hard that they could write it that they magically got their wish granted. And it wasn't by writing a million Doctor Who spec scripts that were so good that eventually they got onto the show. No. The way they got onto the show was through the hard work of being friends with one of the showrunners. <laughs> That's the way up the chain. <laughs> so, the the idea here is that Russell didn't start on Doctor Who. Doctor Who wasn't... Russell... The show was off air in the wilderness years, of course, after McCoy and on either side of the McGann TV movie. The show was off air then. And it was easier to break into Doctor Who in those days because of a couple of reasons. Nate will understand this more than Gig and myself. Doctor Who was novels back then, and then towards the end of that era, it was audio dramas, and there were a couple of other things floating around there as well. But in terms of the novels, there was a specific policy that kind of worked for young writers. Nate, can you explain that at all? Well, yeah, there was an open submission policy that basically anyone could send in a you know a pitch for a novel to the Virgin Books line, and you know, Virgin approved a lot of these. Uh, there, there's a lot of writers who kind of got their start then. Um, and, you know, the, my understanding is that they'd actually be fairly, like, giving in the feedback that uh, they'd give even to their rejections. So, I mean, I think part of that was just that it was a much smaller audience that was interested in, Yeah, you know, nowadays if Big Finish, for instance started an open submission policy like that would just be unworkable no one would you know it would be a total mess everyone would apply um big finish wouldn't have time to respond to anyone but back then it was a much more niche thing of okay who actually knows about the virgin books who knows that there's a submission policy by the time you're at that point you're the kind of person they're interested in who are, who are some of the big success stories from the open submissions scheme Well, let's see. I mean, some of these people may have had some limited careers before their Virgin Books, uh, you know, 
work. But I think Paul Cornell is one of the big ones, right? He really was like kind of the defining person of the Virgin Books era, and he obviously went on to the TV show several times. Um, I, I mean, obviously, Lawrence Miles is near and dear to my heart as a Faction Paradox fan. Uh, he, he has a good story about how his proposal was lost behind the back of like a filing cabinet for two years. So he didn't even hear back, but then they said they approved it and he ended up writing his first novel then. And, um, I mean, Kate Orman, she was Australian. She's great. And she still managed to get on the, yeah, she's phenomenal. So there's, there's a lot of like really, really good writers who came out of that period. Does um, damaged goods fall under that category? of um kind of writers who got accepted into the line because i mean that was a virgin book right it was a new adventure yeah and i feel like it's maybe slightly significant that one of these writers went on to run doctor who <laughs> you know you know it's just the, the limited success you know, some of these writers have had you know i say going on to run doctor who that's probably influential to be fair russell was a professional writer at that time he'd, he'd written plenty of television yeah he he had a career yeah yeah absolutely but i think it really contributed to that sense of, I think, what you're trying to get out here, which is the sense of fan ownership that comes from the wilderness years, like l- giving people their start in Doctor Who, in a way, and seeing people who kind of did that literally go on to create the show itself. I think that really feeds into this idea that fans can work their way into the show through the show, through the franchise, I guess. You can just be a Doctor Who fan and do Doctor Who. Um, it rather obscures the actual interstitial steps in that process. And also, I'll add, um, Stephen Moffat also got his his first contribution to Doctor Who, even though he was he was, I believe, an established writer by then. Yeah. But his first real contribution to Doctor Who was part of a Paul Cornell novel that was later adapted into Human Nature. So, yeah, there could be a tendency to say, but look, they were writing these novels for a dozen. They were writing them just for the. They were writing them just for the other writers to read them. But that's not true. Uh, they were a very niche thing, of course, but they weren't just for people who'd seen Doctor Who, which was functionally cancelled at the point. There are people who came to Doctor Who through those novels, and several of those novels are really, really, really good. And several of them you can you could approach as your entry point into Doctor Who. So it's not like a this you could only ever do this sort of thing if the show was gone and no one was reading it. It's not that. Like, certainly more than TV it is, but it's not a complete, you know, winded away in a corner kind of thing. Yeah, it wasn't just a Fitzroy lot reading <laughs> these books and writing them at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> That's my last piece of this puzzle. So, the Fitzroy Tavern. What is it? Legendary pub in London. Legendary for the fact that a lot of the Doctor Who novel writing crowd spent a lot of time there. There, there would be these informal meetings coordinated on, like, Usenet. Um, I think that's where it started. And there's a lot of drama and discussions that came out of there that eventually wound up making an impact in the books. And it was really a revelation for me when I started learning more about the Fitzroy Tavern, because all of a sudden these little pieces of like, oh, was there coordination between these writers? It was like, oh, yeah, duh. Of course there was coordination between these writers. Or of course, you know, such and such a plot point was a reaction against something another writer had done because these two people were beefing against each other in real life you know this this isn't like some some mystery that needs to be perceived they were just hanging out at the fitzroy it's this very interesting little semi forgotten time of the wilderness years this real location this pub where lots of doctor who writers and fans met and exchanged their homemade fanzines and drank together and plotted things together like nate sang where Stephen Moffat acted um, ultra masculine like an ape, I think, has been characterized by some. (laughs) There's all sorts of interesting stories there. The really interesting thing, and this is where it wraps around to being relevant to this Russell T. Davis thing, is who went there, which is one of those things. I mean, at the time, like physically, tangibly, when it was actually happening, certain people were going there. But over time, people have been inserted into these memories, like the start of Name of the Doctor, where Clara is suddenly in Classic Who. Suddenly certain figures find themselves in the pub, figures who weren't at the pub, but for various reasons, fans and The Guardian 
have decided were at the pub. Like the inverse of the Stalin photograph, where they're just inserting figures rather than erasing them. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Guardian article in 2014 written by Jenny Colgan, who has written various Doctor Who things. She's, she's definitely one of the favorites for the BBC books line right now. Yeah, for Penguin. And so in this 2014 article, Jenny Colgan, who never went to the pub, she's writing this article and she's talking it up. She's talking about the Fitzroy. And there's a paragraph in there where she says, attendees include Cornell, Rob Shearman, Russell T. Davis, Stephen Moffat, Nicholas Briggs, and many other names that were soon to become extremely familiar. And of course, they would fantasize and plot about what they'd do if the show ever did return. That form of fandom was much more active than it is now, Stephen Moffat recalls. You only had what you could create yourself. There was no who on TV. We had nothing. Okay, so The Guardian says Russell T. Davis was part of the Fitzroy lot. Uh, Jenny Colgan, she's a Doctor Who writer. She says Russ was part of the Fitzroy lot. There's no Russell quote in there, but so what? It's official. It's in The Guardian. How could it be false? Here's the thing. A lot of the people who went to the Fitzroy are still alive. And a lot of them are still friends. And so sometimes they tweet at each other. To enter into that, who is Philip Morris? Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not going to give the introduction to, to Philip Morris. Sorry. <laughs> Gig, do you want to? Philip Morris is a hero, isn't he? Yes, the hero of the missing episodes, I think, is basically the, the general idea there. The real Indiana Jones, as he calls himself. So he's a really important fan figure that has gone on epic journeys to locate and track down missing episodes and has had success, like credit to that credit. He's done some great stuff there. He's also got lots of really interesting opinions, especially in recent years. Part of his dislike of Chris Chibnall stems out of this idea that Chris Chibnall attended the Fitzroy. He's got a tweet, for instance, which has a picture of a kind of sneering Chibnall from the Series 11 Blu-ray extras, and it says, Anybody got any ideas? I only got the gig because I'm part of the Fitzroy gang, you know. Someone replies, You know RTD and Chibnall never went to the Fitzroy. Philip replies, Philip's the type of man to always support the Guardian, of course. He says, This says Guardian article confirms you're talking shite, Lance. He doesn't link a Guardian article in that tweet, but of course he's talking about the Jenny Colgan one. And Lance replies, 100% proof. I feel so foolish now that a woman that never went to any fan meetings has written an article saying that <laughs> RTD was in there. Also no mention of Chibnall, but I'm sure the writer meant he was there too. Can't believe I'm such an idiot. Now, if I look at some other tweets from people who attended the Fitzroy because they say they did and other people who went there say yes, they did. Like Johnny Morris, our favorite, or Robert Sherman. <laughs> they're quite tweeting tweets of Philip Morris being angry about Chibnall supposedly being part of the Fitzroy lot. Johnny Morris says, this is deeply unfair. I went to that pub loads and Chris Chibnall never went once. So why am I not in charge? Robert Sherman says, hang on, I thought you were in charge. That must be why all my letters to the production office asking you to bring back the Kraals go unanswered. <laughs> Elsewhere, Clayton Hickman, another attendee of the Fitzroy, as confirmed by himself and other people who went there, says, as if Russell would have been seen dead at the tavern. And if Moffat ever did show up, we'd usually decamp to the other pub up the road. That's later characterized. They didn't, they didn't run away from Moffat. They just kind of moved pubs um, with Moffat sometimes when Moffat was there. This talk of Fitzroy derangement syndrome. Other tweeters bring into it. Uh, <laughs> selecting a highlight of different quotes Philip Morris has about all these three showrunners being at the Fitzroy when we only really have... Moffat pinned to there because Moffat talks about going there and other people who went there talk about Moffat going there. There's none of that for Russell or Chibnall, at least that I could find, and I did search a lot. So basically there is a there is a sort of conspiracy theory, essentially, that the Fitzroy gang has dominated the history of Doctor Who. Yes. So there's other quotes. I was a regular there too and never once saw Chibnall there. Johnny Morris talking about <laughs> when Moffat come when Moffat came, four points, then we four points then do we go to a pizza express so that steven can show off to the waitress who liked press gang <laughs> b the thai c the dodgy italian <laughs> so, someone asks with this idea of moving pubs because moffat was there with moffat or because he'd arrived clayton hickman says ha with him they had actual seats in the other pub and the moffat fan replies few elsewhere robert sherman talks about johnny and himself fighting over billing so you've got this friendly camaraderie with the people who actually went there who also say that Russell didn't go there and Chibnall didn't go there. Why does this matter so much? Because I'm fixated on 
the specifics of this kind of thing. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it bothers me when we get the misinformation ensnared into this, especially in ways that ignites conflict, when we start getting angry at things that never happened and we start heaping people into things. I know when we talk about the Fitzroy lot, Philip Morris is meaning a larger idea that makes some sort of sense, even if I disagree with it. The idea of a boys club, the idea of these men who are friends, those three showrunners helping each other out and everything. I understand he's kind of speaking metonymically about, you know, a larger issue there. But I also feel like when something's completely untrue, it's worth unpacking that a little bit. Russell and Chibnall aren't part of the Fitzroy lot. Fitzroy lot was a specific thing they're not part of. If we're speaking in generational conflict terms when everything gets so ignited, I think it's worth being a little more specific. Yeah, essentially, an older generation isn't just one set of people at the end of the day. You know, it's a, it's a group as you know, varied as anybody. Well, maybe not as anybody. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that RTD wrote a novel for the VNAs does not mean he was part of the same exact, like, friend group as all the other VNA writers, too. Yeah. And the fact Chibnall was enough of a nerd to appear on TV to complain about Doctor Who, like, <laughs> you know, all of us would lo- love to do, <laughs> that doesn't mean he's a wilderness guy. He's talked about how... He admires Mark Platt for his TV work, but he's never read Lung Barrow, you know, which is completely, it's literally more normal than Russell and Davis being, you know, more hooked into the EU. It's, it's more normal than that. But Chibnall isn't part of the EU crowd or the wilderness crowd. And I think it's, it's worth being specific about these type of things, I think. So when we talk about generational conflict, I think clarity is good because it's so easy to get very angry and kind of lump things together and then we're all just fighting. Yeah, so I think like the, the broader... That broader panorama, I think, that loops all this together is that we were talking about fans feeling a kind of co-ownership of the show. Yeah. Because there have been so many different iterations of it with so many different writers, so many different people. And there is, you know, proof, like, positive of, you know, writers who have come in as fans and then later gone on to actually literally be, you know, writers of the show. So I think a lot of fans, like a lot of um, creative fans, kind of have an interest and kind of a belief that, in the sense that almost like, rtd's role or like responsibility is to let someone else do it (laughs) in a way i think that informs a lot of uh maybe a lot of the discourse surrounding rtd too so yeah that him coming back as a showrunner is kind of a a denial of a hypothetical alternative where a newer writer perhaps a writer of a different demographic could have done it and i think you know a lot of the kind of sort of stewing sort of controversy and anger over that the RTD stokes when he says stuff like this about, you know, you know, writers he's mentoring is this idea that, you know, by coming back to the show, RTD represents the older generation reclaiming Doctor Who for themselves and keeping out like hypothetical different showrunner or, you know, I mean, a, a woman showrunner. Like, God, imagine you know, we might have one of those one day, you know, in some hypothetical timeline, maybe in a hundred years, you know, we finally get around to it. You know, nonetheless, RTD coming back is like another delay of any more different voice or a newer voice you know, becoming head of the show. So a lot of, there's a lot of resentment stewing around that. I, I wonder if one day they'll talk about Discord servers in the same way we talk about the Fitzroy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's a to- we, We've moved on. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's an interesting idea. I think it's tough because, like, you know, Usenet discussions are all very well preserved on the old Google sites and shit, but Discord servers, you know, they disappear. You know, they get shut down. They lose stuff. They're not very good for preservation of a fan culture at all. Um, yeah. And unless you're addicted to archiving web pages like I am, stuff disappears on Twitter and on Reddit really quicker than you can ever imagine. Uh, stuff can disappear. And yeah. Yeah. E- even. Oh man, I'm I'm so upset about some of the things that I saw online, like especially Yahoo groups, like the Jade Pagoda. Yeah, that was like a big writer discussion group that was still active. Like, th- oh, and then Outpost Gallifrey. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is off topic. At least Gallifrey Base is still alive somehow. Yeah, for this week it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes, like, it's something we have expressed ourselves. This idea of. But RTD in 2023 isn't the same writer as RTD in 2008, which is completely true, but it's also a separate conversation than this. It's its own conversation, but I think for us to bring that in, it's kind of changing topic. And for other people to bring that in, that's kind of changing topic, which is that's true. And that's going to speak to what the new series might look like. But we're not really talking about that right now. We're talking about who's running it more than what it's actually going to be. It's who's in these positions of authority. But I think there much as we use Doctor Who as a microcosm to talk about societal issues as, you know, the writers themselves do, the fans do, as is totally normal and healthy, I think sometimes we 
start using showrunners as the face for societal issues that actually go quite a bit beyond them, which is like when we're talking about the recession being part of the reason we uh, horror of all horrors stopped getting <laughs> spin-offs. That was the real tragedy of 2008, surely. <laughs> uh, I think the way you know that is kind of, that's beyond <laughs> Russell, obviously. It's beyond the BBC. It's, you know, it's, it's bigger than all that. I feel in that same way, sometimes this generational conflict stuff gets targeted to Russell or um, Gatiss or whoever else when it's, they have a lot of power here, but also some of these things are much deeper rooted than them. It's worth um, remembering, like as RTD tells it in Doctor Who magazine, like the BBC gave him the, the offer of making the show full time again. Now, obviously, you know, his RTD's proposal was just to do the specials, but the BBC were like, hey, come and run it again. <laughs> we didn't have anyone else. And I think the, almost the, the accusation against RTD is almost that having been offered that, he should have just said no so that some hypothetical other person could have done it, you know, regardless of whether or not that person exists or was being looked at by the BBC. You know, at the end of the day, like, the institution of the BBC saw RTD to run it again. And I think to demand of RTD that he just turned it down for you know, the sake of some abstract kind of ethical superiority, rather than do, I guess, what would be the pragmatic RTD thing and just take the reins again, steer it to what he believes is a more sustainable position. I think it's just sort of asking RTD to betray his his, his passion for who, I guess, and his like his his love and desire to uh, curate and steer it. So I think, yeah, I think it just gets very... The, the characterization of RTD as blocking someone or pulling up the ladder just by dint of him being there and being present to run the show again i think it's a bit unfair and i think it it kind of um it absolves the bbc a little bit of failing to actually secure any sort of meaningful succession or like development over the past like 10 years yeah. of the show i mean they, they, you know, the point where they're begging chibnall to take over the show and the head of drama at the time hires chibnall and then fucks off to itv so she doesn't have to live with the fallout of her actions like you know it, it, it's a whole institutional thing it goes back quite a long way yeah there's no reason to think that if the BBC hadn't gone with Davies, they would have picked someone younger or newer or anything like that. Or less white. We can see that he's not like the guy in charge. Like we can see that he's not the guy pulling the strings just by virtue of the fact that he's totally changed his tone on all the streaming stuff. Right? Like he, you know, a as we, as Neo demonstrated, he was a critic of Disney Plus, especially Disney Plus. And, um, and now, you, you won't hear anything like that coming out of his mouth. And, you know, that's not a decision he's making. He's, he's playing the role that he's hired for. Like he said, the Disney thing, the streamer thing was going to happen with or without him. You know, thanks to, it might be partially thanks to him and Bad Wolf that it ended up being Disney of all of them. But it was, they were going to partner with a streamer no matter what. I see people like claim, you know, it's because of RTD that, you know, all this happened. And it's like he says, well, he says anyway, it's not. And I'm inclined to believe him. I know, that the la I know that the last thing, especially like young writers wanting to crack into the show, want to hear is, um, just wait. It makes sense for the old guy who used to do it to do it again because in a couple of years, he might throw us a little bone. Even though he hasn't really specifically said, yes, I'm going to get a bunch of new writers into series 15 or whatever, and that's the whole plan. He hasn't even said that, but some people on Twitter have told me that that's happening and so I've just got to shut up and be happy and this is actually the great and progressive thing to happen. I know that that's bullshit you're totally justified to smart against but at the same time russell is a symptom of a larger issue it's not like he villainously you know laid claim to the show again and crawled up over it's not like he was behind david Tennant slowly eclipsing <laughs> jody whittaker in books and things like that over the course of her run it's not like this has all been a masterminded plan by him to take back the show and give it to go back to the bins gators types these are symptoms of larger things. So it makes all the sense in the world to be angry at RTD or Gatiss and stuff like that. But I feel like you can get a little too blinkered into the kind of personality game with that when there are much larger financial and organizational and societal issues going on with why this kind of thing is happening. Although in some senses, Chibnall did do what a lot of people are kind of want Russell to do, which is like hire like writers who haven't done Who before, who can give different voices and perspectives. You know, Chibnall hired Vinay Patel, who did our, our favourite ep of Chibu, you know? So yeah, you know, I think I, I think it's like th I think it's not unreasonable to want to hold RTD to that same standard at least. So once we see who's working on his era, like series fourteen and onwards, you know, who, who's actually going to be involved? What kind of what kind of will it be monovocal in a way, or will it be 
will it be trying to continue, I guess, the evolution of the show in some way as something to take an interest in, something to look forward to, but not something to be slinging accusations RTD's way at this early in the process, you know? Do you think if RTD did something as regressive as literally rehire a former showrunner to write another episode in a spot in a series which could have gone to a younger writer, do you think if he did something like that, it would be fair to uh, more broadly condemn the kind of weird telos of his era and say that this is a boys club kind of issue and Fitzroy lot or no, we're moving in a disgusting pattern backwards? I think context would matter because I think it would be um, that it would depend what what the other slots are like because if it was just RTD and RTD's old mate <laughs> and then, then <laughs> yeah maybe there's some there's some problems coming in here but you know if you've got like an episode by certain former showrunner which I'm sure would never happen and then that's set against lots of other interesting fresh you know other new writers complete new faces or cool people then it, it doesn't matter quite as much does it so yeah we'll see it's worth dispelling something there which is that, of course, Moffat wouldn't come back to the show. And, you know, he's a big champion of Russell T. Davies' second era, which he knows a bit about. He's talked about how it's going to scare the shit out of fans. So now that, I guess, T. Russell has returned, and last time you came to the union, you said that, you know, um, once you're gone, you're gone. Yeah. Are you tempted to maybe, you know... I've only just left. I mean, it feels like yesterday. <laughs> I think Doctor Who fans would be throwing themselves off buildings if I came back. No, it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not in my immediate plans, no. I mean, uh, doc, uh, for Russell, Doctor is over 10 years ago. For me, it's, uh, what is it, four years? Something like that, three or four years? And it, I, mean, that, I mean, that really does, at my age, feel like yesterday. Uh, it doesn't feel, I, I haven't got perspective on it yet. Maybe the beginning of the Matt Smith stuff starts to feel like a different life, but it, it feels like nothing ago that I was doing it. So uh, I, I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see what Russell's second go round is like, what he does now, because you know, being the restless man he is, it won't be the same as the first time. Don't think you know what you're gonna get, you don't. Uh, I mean, I, and I knew a little bit because we chatted, but uh, he, he's, uh, he wouldn't be doing this unless he could scare the living shit out of you. So uh, <laughs> it will be great. It will be great. He said, I just want it to go on. What do you hope for the future of the show as someone who has been such a big hot part of its history? Um, well, I just want it to go on. I mean, that's the main thing. I just want it to not stop. I want it to, uh, and I know it's going to, to make use of its infinite adaptability to always be the number one predator in the environment. That's what I want. I want it to go on forever. I believe it can. Like the stories of Robin Hood and King Arthur and Sherlock Holmes, some things always go on. You mentioned it might be a bit too recent for you to come back as a showrunner, but potentially as a writer. I know you and Russell are very close and you've written some incredible episodes. Oh, I still think it's a bit, it's, it's, it would be a bit, I mean, career madness, even by my standards, uh, to go back into a junior capacity on a show I used to run. Uh, I would have to be insane to do that. Of course, he loves Doctor Who and he still thinks about it often. He said elsewhere that, well, he said last year in 2022, for me, it feels like yesterday. It feels like yesterday that I wrote Doctor Who. <laughs> but he's, of course, being completely figurative there because like he says, it would be madness to go back to Doctor Who and... As we all know from these sorts of things, you shouldn't look too closely into the wording because that can never reveal anything. Shooty is 14 and so on. <laughs> yes, and mad people, there's no way, you know, a mad person could ever you know, have written Doctor Who or have run it. You know, Moffat is absolutely condemning of madness. You know, he'd never write about a madman in a box or anything like that. No, he would never valorize it at all. No, nope. he wouldn't step onto this landmine of discourse to uh, regressively step back into a show he used to run. That would be insanity. But I also think another part of what he said there is interesting that I just want it to go on forever. Um, the show can go on forever and it should. Um, I don't know if it's really an scope of our discussion there, but that's another interesting idea worth interrogating. Uh, should the show go on forever and why do some people think that's a great idea? Why do some people not like that idea so much? It's an inter interesting topic. Yeah. I, is there any other generational stuff to say before talking about the conciliatory thing he said in The Independent? Uh, at the very end of the article, he talks about how like today's teenagers are going to totally transform television and how he can't wait. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, yeah. And I think that that's, uh, 
I think even then that might have been the start of him saying, "Oh, I've got to, I've got to backtrack on what I said earlier," because it's hard to read that in uh, in combination with what he'd said like earlier in the article. But uh, it definitely brings out the through line with his earlier comments um, from years past about wanting uh, younger writers. Yeah, that's why I'm optimistic. Television can make things better, and the teenagers making new forms of it are going to change it all over again. I can't wait. Yeah, as long as they aren't angry about the media that hates and ignores them, you know, then they'll be fine. The kids are all right as long as they aren't doing that. So the sequel to that Times interview is an interview with The Independent. Uh, how do we characterize The Independent, Gig? Um, I say it's a bit different from kind of stuff like The, the Times and Telegraph. It's, it's, um, I'd say it's more kind of floating around in the middle. Uh, you know, maybe it's got slightly, slightly looser kind of... Um, I would say it's maybe got a bit more, uh, slightly more progressive acceptability to it <laughs> in some ways. Like, I wouldn't say it's, it's not some like oh super left wing paper or whatever, but it's it, it's just kind of there, really. I don't really, <laughs> I don't feel it really sticks out a huge deal. So the Times interview was the 29th of January 23. The Independent one is the 1st of February, so a couple of days later. The headline is: People like me can make way for trans storytellers. Russell T Davis on Nolly. Doctor Who, and making progress on screen. So, one of the early bits of the article talks about RTD returning to Doctor Who, and he says, We've still got 10 months until my first episode, so I'm keeping my powder dry, but you'll see in November that it's not a radically changed show. It's lasted for 60 years because it's good. It needs a bigger budget and a bigger profile, and hopefully that's what we're bringing to it. The article goes on, with Disney Plus having acquired international streaming rights, Doctor Who is poised to benefit from world-class production values. Are they really spending £10 million an episode? Quote, I wish we had £10 million. If we did, I'd be flying around on a private jet. He talks about Yasmin Finney, the trans actress playing Rose in the Tenet specials. And then the article ends with saying, change is happening. Diversity on screen is improving across the board, Davis says. Quote, good people are doing the work. It's not just a trans thing. It's about showing every form of sexuality and every race. And the point now is for gatekeepers like me to make way for trans storytellers, because that's when you really improve things. No one can change the TV landscape on their own, Davis adds. He lightens the mood with a nice bit of self-deprecation. Quote, and I'm getting old now, that's the truth. The article says... So this isn't a Davis quote, this is the article. I can't say I'm convinced. Even after talking about TV all day, Russell clearly has energy left to burn. Russell's last quote, it's all about stories for me, and there's always another story to tell. So this is sort of the inverse of everything negative people might have taken away from the Times quote, isn't it? In the sense that he's literally framing himself as, well, I suppose he, he frames himself as a gatekeeper, sort of like an older gatekeeper kind of way, who, who's, who's, whose job is ultimately to get out of the way. And he, the way he phrases that is not the sense that I'm getting out of the way now, but rather at some point in the future, <laughs> when, when I've done my big thing, I will graciously, I, I will enable basically the next uh, generation to take over from me. I will mentor them like he's doing. So it, it, it's like, a, it's a, it's much more like, it is conciliatory in a way. It, it's much more um, reciprocal and kind of uh, forgiving and interested and intrigued by what, you know, the youth and the different uh, types of, people are doing so it, you know i think it's very hard to pin rtd with like some sort of reactionary like oh he, he's against the, the youth or whatever kind of viewpoint because he's advocating quite strongly for different uh, kinds of representation yeah and maybe is that like a first hint of where his era in on who his second era might ultimately go it, where does he see himself as like opening the gate for someone else for other writers to basically like m- bring more like diversity and variance to Doctor Who uh, once once he's out of the way or even while he's still in an exec uh, role. That sounds nice. I hope that that's his. I mean, something that kind of appeals to me about the idea of an you know Davies and also maybe even another former showrunner coming back to write for an upcoming season is that it would kind of give an idea of continuity in a show that has been desperately lacking it these last like half decade. Um, the, the idea of not just, okay, we're going to keep doing the same old thing until, until they fire us all and bring in new people instead that he's 
thinking of his himself as a proactive agent in that process. Um, I hope that that'll lead to a, a smoother transition into whatever that vision of the, you know, the teenager's vision of the future is. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for a passing of the torch, like an actual sort of, you know, making... Yes. Like transitioning from one to the next, rather than just <laughs> sort of stopping dead and like, okay, whatever. You know, in the sense that, that like Moff had his um his introduction almost before he became the full showrunner. He was setting things up. He was kind of... There was a lead-in to his takeover of the show, in a way. Like his previous story kind of laid the groundwork for that. So it would be nice to see, like, whoever the next big voices are, like, working their way in under the guidance of RTD and then, like, becoming, like, the full... Y- y- you see what I'm talking about here? Like, just, like, to actually have a natural growth and organic development. That's the benefit of spin-offs too, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I have some excerpts from an interview discussion RTD did with the Wonderbirds channel in January 2023 that I think are worth bringing up here. Uh, Well, one of the bits of it is just a Series 9 reference that took me by surprise, but there's some really directly relevant stuff in this longer interview as well. Actually, before we listen to those RTD January 2023 bits and bobs, I want to play a bit of a released February 2023 Moffat interview, which primes some of the same concepts Moff touches on here. Uh, First, the actual sort of audiences and markets Stock 2 interacts with, then the matter of the show's budget, then what a showrunner is. What what was it like coming in? You are aware that when you're dealing, how shall I put it, with the hyper-invested, that nothing will ever be right, and certainly nothing will ever be right for everyone. That's fair enough. That's absolutely fair enough. Mm. But as Russell once put it, uh, if a Doctor Who fan hates an episode, that means they watch it 30 times instead of 40. It's all right. You're not actually playing to that audience, no. really, at all. Um, and the first people to agree with that would be Doctor Who fans who would like the show to be a mainstream hit, so they know that, that they're not always going to be catered for in the front line. So it's fine. It was just brilliant. It was just brilliant fun to do that show. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Was it a big budget? No, it's not as big a budget at any point as it ever should have been. I think uh, I think Russell's got some more now, which is good. That's Russell uh, T. Davis. Yeah, Russell T. Davis is charge, yeah. back in charge of it again. Uh, but generally speaking, I think it obviously uh, should have the biggest budget in the world, is what I always think, because it's the most demanding show to make. You've got one set that you use every week, the inside, inside the TARDIS, and two main characters, sometimes three, mm. they run out the doors of that set in the first minute, and everything else you're buying, everything else costs you. So I, it should have the biggest budget in the whole world. So what's included in the term showrunner, which is mm. what you've been described as um well what the real job title is and kind of you know within the, you know contractually and in the credits you'll notice there is no role showrunner but what it generally speaking means uh is the uh the exec- uh, is executive producer and lead writer or sometimes the executive producer and solo writer of the show so the the one of the executive producers who also writes it it's it's probably sort of total editorial control it's control of the fiction of it Right. If it didn't really happen, I gave the order. So it is king of the heap. Mm. King of the heap in a way. Oh, Tell that to my wife. Stupid. Tell that to my uh, <laughs> all the people I work with would be astonished to know that I was king of the heap. Yeah, and in these RTD clips, RTD makes maybe a Series 9 reference with these not, like, not big Doctor Who women, which just sort of amuses me considering some of the weird vagueness parts of the show have sometimes treated Series 9 with. Anyway... Uh, Russell then talks about the showrunner role and he also, before that, goes into how long he will be doing RTD2 and what he might do afterwards. Let's listen. Next, I'm going to be a long time on Doctor Who next. That's my next project. I'm kind how of are you? Working a lot on that already. Um, we've got specials coming up at the end of the year. We've got a new Doctor coming up. So I'll be a while on that. I'll have to commit a few years of my life to it, which is a joy and, and exciting. But um, there are other things I want to write, so I'll get back to them eventually. Oh, can we have a can we have a Wonder Birds monster or something that comes in? <laughs> That's far too frightening. That's far too frightening. <laughs> what are you doing to the children of Great Britain? <laughs> you imagine oh. a hybrid. <laughs> a hybrid. A hybrid Absolutely. of all of us. Oh, oh. You're, you're show running on Doctor Who, Russell, aren't you? I know that. That's an American yes. term. I'm saying more of it now, but that's sort of everything, really. It, is. it means kind of that. I mean, all it means is I take the credit for a lot of experts, really. But it means you're not just writing the scripts; you're part of the 
casting. And, it's, and that's quite a rare thing in this country for a writer to do, isn't it? I remember Tony yeah. ha- Tony McHale did it on Holby, and I think yes. he was the first person ever to do that. So lovely, Tony McHale. What a lovely man he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yes, it's it's becoming it's becoming more and more prevalent because it's how it should be. The I mean, the right. I sit here and invent all these people and type it all out, and so I know how things should look. You know, it's like it makes sense for the writer to continue as part of production and continue to have their say while also listening to the experts. It's like there's it's no some it, it, I think you're an idiot as a showrunner if you sit there saying, no, that shirt should be blue, not yellow. You're not there to do that. You're there to appoint brilliant people who'll find the exact right shirt. So you don't need to worry yeah. about that stuff. But yeah, um, I know. there's three things there that I think are interesting. One is ITD putting kind of a number on how long he's going to be doing this on Doctor Who again. Two is RTD making a joke about the hybrid in a conversation for normal people. And three is RTD defending the showrunner position, which in our last RTD2 conversation, the RT Disney one, we were talking about how Disney Plus, at least on the Marvel end, doesn't use showrunners. It likes to split those jobs up. And so I know some people agree with that. And for years, they've ordered a new who to split the job up and not do it like this anymore. But I like hearing RTD defend the position. Uh, yeah, what do we think of those three things? I think RTD's estimate of how long he's going to be doing it is, um, yeah, uh, like it, yeah, it's a few years. Like it's a, uh, it's a reasonable. I, I would hope that it's a sign of him thinking about what comes next, kind of like how. I mean, maybe you know, I'm not saying he has to like plan his exit strategy or whatever, but I think you know a lot of the thinking with fans around RTD two is almost like he'll be doing it forever. Whereas in real, in reality, realistically, this is something he can only do for so long. So in the sense of whatever future he's building for the show, it also needs to kind of have like a next step. It needs to be like ideas and like how it will be structured. And maybe it will be shorter than a lot of people would like because people understandably love Russell. But, you know, I think, you know, more is not always necessarily, you know, better. I think quality is more important than quantity. So, yeah. Elsewhere in that interview, he talks about, he's asked, does he still have gestating ideas in his head for future shows like how Nolly and uh, Queer as Folk and It's a Sin and Doctor Who, the first go around, were in his head for lots of years. And he said, yeah, he's got plenty of ideas just heading away that he wants to do after Doctor Who. So more to come. He needs to complete a uh, 1981 trilogy, right? He already has two shows set then. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to see what else is there. But uh, yeah, no, I like that. I, Gig, I like what you said about the exit strategy i think it would be responsible for him to sort of plan his exit strategy i i'm looking forward to seeing how russell approaches this and to see if he can do a better uh more cohesive job of it i certainly hope so i don't think disney would accept anything less can he find another moffat to take over that isn't just the old moffat to take over again (laughs) let's get vinay back it's what i would like if we're bringing anyone back Get an ambitious guy who can write good Doctor Who. I'd love to see him return if we're bringing anyone back. I'd also be interested in seeing Peter Harness come back to do an episode. I know that we're not we're not really voyaging far from the uh, the, the demographic profile here. Yeah, the template balding white dude. He has more experience under his belt with writing shows, and I've really liked all his adaptations um, yeah. of things. So that, at the very least, I hope that he'll be able to write another episode or just get back in Who somehow. Yeah, we stand hard on this here. But, you know, again, the template. I'm looking forward to his uh, Zygon novel. Oh, yeah, that's going to be great. Yeah, and his, um, his show with, um, think with Mike, uh, but of course, or Mike, I know he's doing a Constellation, I think it's called. It's, yeah, an actual big sci-fi show. So he's got lots in the pipeline. Uh, I loved his War of the Worlds. So he'd be cool to see back, even though, yeah, he <laughs> kind of regressive, I guess you could say, in some ways. But there's writers besides Russell, however you slice it. There's people besides him either way. So hopefully there's some of those. I think either way, RTD is probably going to be stretched thin, either writing them or rewriting everyone else's. So Yeah, I'm curious to see if he approaches the credit thing differently like i know he basically rewrote many episodes of his original tenure um, but still kindly left the credit to the original author um the author of the first draft i should say and i'm curious to see if he'll kind of take a more chibnall route of co-writing every episode from the bat 
if nothing else, it's simpler when they put their names everywhere, like Chibnall did or Moffat started doing in the Capaldi era. Yeah. There's another um, RTD quote from the writer's tale I just think is kind of relevant when he's talked about, he's talking about why does he like television so much? I know in a Nolly interview, he talked about how TV is like his home base and he's seen like an opera once or twice and it spooked him and back to TV he went. And so in the writer's tale, he says, I watch TV. I love TV. If there's a big movie on TV tonight, I'm still much more likely to be hopping my way between the X Factor, Casualty and Smallville. TV is my first choice always. Therefore, I think TV. When I think of more gay men, I don't think of a one-off story. I think of a six-part TV series immediately. That's instinctive. I like looking at new televisual shapes too. I'd love to write a drama in 52 episodes, once a week, half an hour, on BBC 3 or 4. Just the simple story of a man in his life, so you can see how character and story develop over a whole year. That idea sprang out of the conversations we're having here. No, you can't have 10%. I'd call it 365, or maybe happy birthday, if you started and ended on the man's birthday. I'd like that, because I think a lot of telly still apes film, and not enough says, look, here's a sprawling constant available to all art form that doesn't often take advantage of its uniqueness. A story can last a year, literally. I find that exhilarating, and knackering, because I'd have to write them all, God help me. Imagine having, imagine having to write a half-hour script every week. I'm interested in what would happen to me. That ends that. Interesting. Some of it ties into soap discussion. We did a Nolly talking about, you know, writing so much television so quickly and everything. Part of it ties into our discussion about how much RTD will be writing of RTD2, talking about how it's exhausting to write so much. And part of it is just the stuff that's utter music to my ears, which is talking about TV in the shape of TV and doing TV that caters to being TV, uh, which is the stuff I love. And Russell does play around with TV formats. Look at the cucumber, banana, tofu triptych thing he kind of did where, you know, there was a web documentary series that was like non-fictional on the topics raised in the two fictional series. And one of them was an experimental kind of almost short film anthology series that sometimes got uh, writers besides Russell on to write episodes. And it kind of flitted around the edges of the Mothership Cucumber Show, which was the big actual RTD mothership show yeah, his mention of um the, his idea there of a show that has an episode every week for a whole year yeah you know, that kind of also seems to remind me of something that we might look at later which is when he talks about <laughs> like the idea of having so many spin-offs that you'll have content like all year round for a particular franchise like that almost seems to be related i think the idea of um like tv as a shape that's able to constantly be there like with the audience almost like on a regular basis Whereas a film comes out, like a studio maybe puts one out every so often, and like it's the big event of the year or whatever. Whereas TV is so, you know, it's so omnipresent almost. Maybe that that's part of it as well. Yeah, there was a moment in the big streaming boom during uh, when most COVID lockdowns were happening, where I felt like Marvel Studios was really kind of circling around being able to have like something every week for the whole year. Yeah, they didn't quite get there, but it felt really close. And so I think it's achievable this sort of idea. Of like a constant drip of a certain franchise. Well, the question of whether it's all good is another question altogether. <laughs> of course not. Yeah, conceivable maybe, possible maybe. W- would it be desirable? I don't know if, I mean, I love you guys, but I don't know how often I'd want to come onto the weekly <laughs> discussion of RTD's year-long project. I mean, I I think the... Yeah, it, it would just it would just oversaturate the market, so to speak, you know, and yeah, maybe get old somewhere around week twenty three, you know. <laughs> so, our earlier RTD two chats, we've talked about reasons Russell has offered up for returning to the show, and clarity is offered into how it all happened. Like he's been breaking down, you know, evolved from the tweet alongs. Catherine Tate and David Tennant and Russell were all kind of half joking about coming back. And they went to the BBC. This is their story. And Russell does characterize this as, keep in mind, Doctor Who anecdotes are sometimes great stories and not actually what happened. But, you know, they came to the BBC and said, can we do this? Like, um, we're going over Chibnall's head as a kindness because he's busy. But can we do this for the 60th? Would that be cool? And take over the show, do everything, was the BBC's response. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah. Yeah, that's more or less how he summarizes it. Okay. So, we have more motivations different sort of motivations coming out here. So, in a GQ interview, mostly about Nolly, uh, but there's stuff about Doctor Who in here. GQ asks, how long had you considered coming back to Doctor Who? Russell says, 
Well, honestly, it wasn't a plan of mine, although I have to issue a massive caveat there and say, as a massive Doctor Who fan since the age of three, I think about it all the time. And when I wasn't producing it, people would always say, oh, you know, are you going to write Doctor Who again? And it was a bit rude while there were other people in the job to say, oh, yes, I'll think about it now. It's like there were other people running the show. GQ say, remind me then for my benefit, why do you leave in the first place? Russell says, other things to write, simple as that. Cucumber, actually. And then my husband was ill, so I left in 2010. That was my last episode. And we both went to America. The Cucumber script was written there. And then he fell ill, so everything got delayed by about five years. But Cucumber was burning in my head. If Doctor Who hadn't come along, I would have written that back in 2004. What would it have been like then? Oh my god. How would we have had that conversation then? Would it have been more explosive or more strange? Because it would be the same script. Nothing changed in terms of what happened to that couple. I was thinking about them as early as into the 90s. GQ say, so why return now to Doctor Who? Like we say in the immediate aftermath of It's a Sin, you could probably write anything you want. Russell says, well, this is the Star Trek quote that I'm about to read out, but I don't want to get into the Star Trek of it all yet. I want to keep talking about the motivations. But So we're going to park the Star Trek... Uh, what's the Star Trek ship called? The uh, the Enterprise? The Enterprise. We're going to park the Enterprise for a moment. So Russell says, you're right, you're right. Partly it's simply that I love it and have always loved it, but the world has changed and we're now in the age of the streamer. I watch the Star Trek Empire with vast envy. The way that's turned itself from an old archive show into something fantastic. The cast is so progressive, so good, so beautiful and very cleverly. I think Star Trek is reaching out to making something like 52 episodes a year. So that's your yearly show. Genius. And there's a problem with the BBC. It's a public service broadcaster, so there's only so much they'll ever commit to. I'm going to park that there and not read out the rest of the Star Trek thing, because we're still thinking about his motivations for coming back. There's a bit more talk about budget. RTD is correcting them that it's not actually $10 million an episode. One of the things GQ asks also is, has the larger budget changed your creative approach? Russell says, yes, I think it does. It's one of the reasons I've come back. You can tell stories on a bigger scale. It's the same old problems. I still have to cut scenes because they're too expensive. And I still have to reduce the number of monsters and things like that. But my imagination feels more free. A lot more free, actually. It's just a joy to write anyway. I'm really proud of it. Oh my god, there are some strong episodes coming up. GQ. Would you have come back if David Tennant and Catherine Tate hadn't? Russell? Oh, probably yes. I mean, that's just an added delight. Their willingness to do it was part of the reason I picked it up in the first place. They said, wouldn't it be a laugh to do something for the 60th? So I went to the BBC not knowing that they were getting ready to make Doctor Who bigger anyway. So it's like I walked into a trap. No, everything coincided at the right time. And then he talks up series 14 and he talks up the Tennant miniseries. Really interesting that he says he probably he probably still would have done it without Tennant and Tate because wasn't his narrative that this emerged out of Tennant and Tate and him approaching the BBC? I think, um, was it Jane Tranto who said, like, he was sort of making murmurings about how he'd do it, like, much earlier. So it's clearly something that was simmering inside him and maybe it would have virgined out eventually even if Tennant and Tate hadn't, like, given him the push, like, the prod to actually go out and do it. So that stuff's interesting and we'll come back to the Enterprise Envy, the Star Trek Envy in a minute. But there's another interesting motivation for Russell. Well, there's another interesting piece to the puzzle of Russell coming back that I've seen less discussed uh, that I want to bring up. So there's this Radio Times uh, 31st January 2023 article headline, Russell T. Davis on comfort of Doctor Who return after his husband's death. Radio Times says, When asked whether dealing with the loss of his husband, Andrew, who passed away in 2018, has got any easier, Davis said, no, and I don't expect it will. Radio Times, during his husband's illness, Davis gave up work to be his carer. Now, RTD revealed, quote, it isn't killing me. I'm quite glad that I've gone back to writing Doctor Who because psychologically I'm thinking he knows what I'm doing now. It gives me comfort. It's when you do new things he never experienced that it feels odd and you don't enjoy it so much. In some ways, it has got worse because it's, oh, you're still not coming back. Maybe it's why Andrew keeps popping up in everything I write. 
even in Nolly with the scenes of her cancer, I found myself visiting hospitals. There's been death in a lot of the stuff I've written over the past few years. I don't mind that. I'm glad. It feels richer. That's that's the end of Art at Ease piece in that article. It's incredibly fascinating to see how his return to Doctor Who is kind of paralleled with like different shifts in his own life and kind of um not to like psycho- psychoanalyze but what he kind of offers here is like a almost like a uh, a return to Doctor Who as part of his um I guess his journey of like dealing with like his own grief and like the the changes in his own life and the way in which going back is in in some way like a form of time travel slightly but also not it's interesting it sounds just like you know there's kind of a trope i saw most recently in that movie tar where after something goes really bad in a person's life and they kind of need a reset they go home right and uh you know in returning home they find themselves somewhat and obviously i'm not saying that's what he's doing here but that is kind of the the same idea that he's getting at that he's returning to things that are uh comfortable things that you know he shared with his partner and i think that's um it's hard you know it's tough um it's i'm glad that there's that aspect to it and it's not just 100% career driven i guess yeah memory becomes i think all devouring in the presence of grief because you know mem- when memory is all you have left of a person you know you, you are you, you become preoccupied with it either you know focusing on it or trying to avoid it or whatever so it's when you have that interfacing with something like a return to a show you used to do and the way that memory plays into that whether you're being nostalgic with it or you're trying to sort of reinvent Doctor Who again or whatever. Like, it's nonetheless, like the, the two things are interwoven in a way that's really complex and really interesting. It does. There's so much familiarity at play with RTD2. It's, you know, Bad Wolf, literally the same producers Russell bought the show back with in 2004, 2005. It, it's interesting how he characterizes some of that here. I think I get what he means in that I know with deaths with people I've known and stuff, there is that kind of element of when you continue changing and growing as a person and doing stuff that there's people that have passed away in my life and they never knew me as, you know, the things I've become since. And there's kind of that sadness in that, even though I'm very happy with things I've become since, there's no connection. I don't, I'll never have their opinion on those things. I'll never have any reaction from them on those things. When I do things I used to do, I kind of have more of that connection because I can remember, oh, they judged me, you know, when I did that and they thought me doing this was this way or whatever because we shared that. But we don't share who I've become since because there's that disconnection since they passed away. And so I get what he means. There's a kind of warmth or familiarity when you're doing something you did or you're being someone you were when someone was still around. It feels more like a connection there or at least the memories come more compared to if you're being the person you've continued to develop into being. I totally get what he means. And I think that's a really interesting characterization of part of how he's back on running Doctor Who now, which is a part of his life. You know, he must remember very vividly and was tied into all these relationships he had and people he was with, which was tied into, you know, being with Andrew and working with all these people he's working with again, you know, including David Tennant. So, yeah, it's really interesting what he's talking about there I, I get what he's saying and i think again it kind of makes resenting rtd for coming back seem even pettier <laughs> i think in in light of that because, because it's, just, it's just such a small thing almost like in in the wider scheme of things i'd be like oh my god why did you come back to doctor who and someone else could have done it it's like well you know he's doing it and it's incredibly i just feel like the the important things just seem to outweigh that so much so he's saying I need Gatiss with me because Gatiss reminds me of the happier times of my life. And I'm sorry, young writers, but you weren't, a, you weren't born then, so you can't come on the show. This is part of my psychological exercise. Young writers, to the bins, I need my Gatiss. <laughs> Gatiss didn't actually... Well, yes, he did. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I completely forgot that Gatiss wrote any um, RTD1 episodes. My God. He was even in some. Yes, he was in. He starred. Yes. <laughs> I, I'd retconned myself into thinking that Moffat brought uh, Gatiss in. Which, uh, yeah, that's Moffat absolved of another crime. Should we hop back on the Enterprise or? Yes, let's go back to the Enterprise. So returning to that GQ interview, let's go back to that Star Trek stuff, which I didn't finish. So he's talking about how... I watched the Star Trek Empire with vast envy, the way that's turned itself from an old archive show into something fantastic. Cast is so progressive, so good, so beautiful. 52 episodes a year. 
genius. Problem with the BBC, only so much it'll commit to. RTD continues. So I thought, with no criticism whatsoever towards the people who were running it at the time, because they were running it within the BBC's measures, it was time for the next stage for Doctor Who. I thought, the streaming platforms are ready. The spin-offs are ready. I always believed in spin-offs when I was there. I did Torchwood as a spin-off. The Sarah Jane Adventures as a spin-off. Those spin-offs declined when I left. And I can see why. And I very much left after 2008, when the money became scarce. I think that's fair enough for the public service broadcaster that the money is spent on other things. But now it wasn't my idea. It was the BBC's notion to go for a streamer to invest in the show worldwide, which I completely agree with. We're not on the budget level with Star Wars and the Marvel shows. And then he talks about they're not on the Star Wars level. They're not on the Star Trek level. But quote, it's more than I've ever had to work with. And then there's that quote about the budget is one of the reasons he's come back, telling stories on a bigger scale. Still the same old problems, but still it's a lot more money. What do we think of all this? And the Star Trek quote, I think, uh, maybe drew a lot of, well, it, it drew my attention. I don't know if it's drawn a lot of people's attention. But certainly in terms of a model for what RTD maybe conceives his ideal Doctor Who empire to look like, and this is close to an, an explicit example as he's given, and you know, we can see how the Star Trek kind of current uh sort of um, set of shows is is going at the moment, how it's playing out. You know, people have various opinions on the varying quality of those, I think, five-ish shows. Um, it's a... Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a big Star Trek fan. I've not watched uh, much of the stuff. I know um, some of the shows have kind of better reputations than others. But um, I think it, it's it's useful to have an example of what he's aiming for and kind of what he envies, what his, what his end goal is. Yeah, I think, I mean, we definitely saw this tendency in his original run when, you know, as we discussed, he was involved in two spinoffs, right? He he very much, and I think in this context, it's interesting to think about his defense of the showrunner's position, right? He almost kind of made it sound almost uh, monarchical in a way, how you're the executive, right? You're You're appointing people to take care of things for you, but that there's like a skill in being the executive, in, in making those appointments, in doing that overseeing role. And I very much see his return to um, Doctor Who as like as a career move, you know, because all the psychological stuff aside, which is obviously a big point, but as a career move, it's a little odd, you know, it's um, going back to a role that you previously did just as well. It only makes sense that he's doing this in conjunction with his broader ambition. He is looking out and seeing Star Trek, he's seeing Marvel, and he's saying, oh, I wish I could be at the head of one of these. And I think that the the only option for him is achieving it through Doctor Who. I'm not, you know, I, as a Star Trek fan, I love The Next Generation. I watch some of the Picard show. Um, I haven't been, like, blown away by either the Star Trek slate, not just in the quality of the episodes, but how they've been pacing out the different shows. I feel like they haven't been managing the hype in a way that is, like, conducive to the kind of MCU-fication that they're trying to achieve. But regardless... Um, like if this is his ambition i'm interested to see what he does with it i hope that it'll be better than the star trek version um so that comparison was worrying for me uh but i think that's well yeah i'm excited he outlines there what he sees as i guess the virtues of having a big empire with spin-offs like that like he describes how star trek has like a really wide cast and it's so progressive and also he mentions that they have like what 52 episodes a year so constant content which he sees almost like again like i uh, sort of alluded to earlier it's kind of like a he almost sees that as like a virtue unto itself like being able to have like a full year just stacked with uh with uh with, with content and um Obviously, uh, as I think we've talked about in another discussion, he RCD is someone who sees television as something capable of doing like really real good and like bringing real like joy and like development and good things to people. So in a sense, more of it being a good thing is something you can easily see him. Like you can see why he thinks that way. Um, I think maybe there might be concerns with the idea of spin-offs as just there to pad out the year's running schedule rather than 
catering to different kinds of viewer, if you see what I mean. Because, because like, if you're saying, well, we're doing spin-offs so we can have Doctor Who all year round, then you're, in, you're implying that the spin-offs are just more Doctor Who. I mean, and I don't know if, um, I, th- I'm, I think the, the Star Trek spin-offs, they have different kind of formats, don't they? Like, one's a cartoon sitcom, one's a CGI kind of kids show, one's kind of maybe more classic-ish, one's more serialised, I don't know what's going on with, with Picard or whatever, but you know, there, there's some variance there. So it's not all just Star Trek. So I would hope that if RTD is doing his whole sort of pitch for like a building out an empire of Doctor Who, that the different things aren't all just more slop for Doctor Who, Doctor Who fans to devour. Like, you, they, they need to have their own identity, surely. There's an interesting tension there, because as the creative, right, as the creator, I understand that there's an impulse to sort of draw people into your web, so to speak. Like, when he says, that's your show for the year, right, he, he's imagining people who are like, okay, I'm tuned into this and this is my like media consumption in the same way that there are people out there who like only watch Marvel stuff somehow. Um, and you know, I, I think that's, that's very, it's a compelling vision. It's tempting from the side of a creator, but, uh, especially when he has such lofty goals of, you know, social transformation through television and joy and these good things. But I don't know if it's, sustainable from the side of a consumer like i'm not interested in doctor who being my only media intake or the doctor who universe i should say so i I have a bit of trepidation around that but frankly i was fine not watching most of uh i I still haven't seen a single episode of flux i'm very proud to say that i saw the uh (laughs) no that's not true i saw the first one um and i saw power of the doctor but like I'm okay with kind of stepping back from Doctor Who if that's what I need to do in order to match um, RTD's energy here. I have a couple of thoughts on all that. One is I think it's worth just reminding ourselves of the pre-RTD2 Russell quote, which uh, flared up a lot of this spin-off discourse, which was that Paul Kirkley interview where he said in uh, – this was published in January 2021. He said, I was in the middle of running an empire and my God – I did that 10 years too soon, didn't I? There should be a Doctor Who channel now. You look at those Disney announcements of all those new Star Wars and Marvel shows, you think we should be sitting here announcing the Nyssa Adventures <laughs> or the return of Donna Noble and you should have the 10th and 11th Doctors together in a 10-part series genuinely. And I think that will happen one day if we can just shift Doctor Who up a year. Paul Kirkley says even the Nyssa Adventures. Russell says, yes, you laugh. But did Star Trek fans ever think they'd be getting a Captain Pike series? Ever? That's insane. The whole science fiction world is so creative and so money-making now. I think your wildest dreams can come true. Though that's already happened with Doctor Who. It talks up even the Daleks. So if you want the Nissa adventures, it'll happen one day. So Star Trek invoked there as well. Yes. Now, relevant to all this talk of growth and money... And expansion is a recent article delving more into the BBC side of this. So this is from Deadline. So it's from one of the three trades of Deadline, Hollywood Reporter and Variety. So it's more reliable than all those reposting Drek publications so many pull from online and that I complain about a lot. But of course, even the trades aren't angels and get some things wrong. Like this Deadline article contains a section saying... The show's budget is believed to be increasing from around 3 million pounds slash 3.8 million US dollars per episode to circa 10 million pounds slash 12.3 million US dollars, which we of course saw Russell push back on in Doctor Who magazine when he said that 10 million pound figure had been exaggerated and if that was the budget he'd be speaking to readers from his base on the moon. To quote Russell directly, that is not the budget and I worry that misinformation like that creates false expectations. Nonetheless, we have a lovely, handsome budget, and we're very happy with how we're proceeding with it. But despite that specific point, Deadline is a trade, and there are some interesting quotes in here that contextualize a lot of the stuff we've been talking about this discussion especially. So the article is titled, BBC Studios Boss Talks, quote, excellent, quote, Doctor Who Deal, M&A and International Growth. The article is mostly a write-up on a mid-January 2023 interview between Deadline and BBC Studios CEO Tom Fussell. BBC Studios, of course, being a commercial arm content company of the BBC. Deadline says the BBC Studios battle 
co-production deal for Doctor Who, plus particularly the global streaming agreement deal with Disney Plus, highlight how, quote, BBC Studios led by Fussell and BBC Director General Tim Davey is unashamedly and aggressively focused on generating more income for the UK's leading public service broadcaster, even for prized in-house IP like Doctor Who. In the past, conservatism often has led strategy. The article talks up how big and seismic the Disney Plus deal for Doctor Who is in particular, contextualising it as part of BBC Director General Tim Davey and BBC Studios CEO Tom Fussell's aims to turn BBC Studios into a fully global operation, how they're seeking to double the company's size in the next few years, growth, etc, etc. CEO Fussell says, We are a BBC company with the BBC values at heart and a stamp of excellence on our programs. And we can use that to make money out of them. Stamp of excellence of our programs, I assume. The BBC's editorial standards are why people come to us globally. The article gets a bit vague talking about how the Disney Plus deal has superseded existing and long-standing prior arrangements like the BBC had with Australia's ABC for Doctor Who. Uh, But the article does say directly, the show, Doctor Who, had played on networks such as the ABC in Australia for decades. In the US, it had been on BBC America and HBO Max but CEO Fussell was clear about the commercial incentive for the new agreements. Fussell didn't comment directly on the previous deals, but sources within the BBC say the company hugely values those relationships and continues to work closely with them across a range of content. Now, the really interesting bit of the article to me is where it says, reports estimated BBC Studios could lose around £40 million slash $49.3 million US dollars in production fees due to the Bad Wolf co-production arrangement. CEO Fussell, who took his role officially in October 2021 after an interim spell as BBC Studio CEO, said he saw, quote, a lot of articles written at the time, quote, about the Bad Wolf agreement and now offers a counter-argument. Fussell, quote, I want to say both sides of the BBC are very happy. We have a brilliant showrunner in Russell T. Davis and a fantastic production partner in Bad Wolf, well known in scripted and in Hollywood. The license fee payer still gets the show in the UK, it now has an enhanced budget, an editorial value and BBC Studios is making a commercial reward. That ticks all the boxes. End Fussell quote. Continuing with deadline quote. In particular, the Disney Plus deal provides quote, an excellent commercial outcome for the BBC and BBC Studios quote. No financial information has been provided, but reading between the lines, the distribution agreement should offset losses elsewhere. The article then says the budget figure that RTD pushed back on in Doctor Who magazine, and then Deadline pulls from some of its own sources, not the mid-January 2023 interview with Fussell. The article saying, Overall, industry watchers we've spoken to have largely given the thumbs up to the new arrangement. It's progressive and will hopefully give the show a genuine creative refresh, said one former BBC exec. I'm sure the finance is off the charts, added another source. One senior source said BBC Studios' approach to Doctor Who was representative of a broader BBC embracing a more commercial future. CEO Fussell, who has been with the organisation since 2016 when he joined as CFO, has indeed been encouraging his staff to find new business lines to exploit. They are eyeing local and international production acquisitions and talent deals, considering local BBC-branded production hub launches and pushing for more lucrative international licensing agreements, such as those struck for Doctor Who and Aussie-made Kids Hit Bluey, which goes out through Disney Plus internationally, but is also on the BBC in the UK and the ABC in Australia. More format deals for the likes of Luther, Ghosts and Doctor Foster, along with unscripted hit Strictly Come Dancing, aka Dancing with the Stars, add another arrow to the quiver. With expansion in mind, the BBC Studios' borrowing limit was increased from £350 million pounds slash $430 million US dollars to £750 million pounds slash $925 million US dollars in 2021. Quote, we haven't taken our debt over £350 million pounds yet, but we have plans in due course to do so, says Fussell. That will be on acquisitions and investment in all areas. The mandate we have is very clear, to grow for the long-term future of the BBC. And then moving down a few paragraphs, Deadline says, Of course, these ambitious plans come at a tricky time. The BBC is under pressure to be both public service for the UK 
and commercially aggressive in a global market where streamers are tightening their belts and economies are shrinking. It's no easy task, but sources who know Fussell, a former Shine Group financial chief and commercial director for publishers HarperCollins UK and Random House, back his business acumen and relationships across the corporation. Quote, his experience is more on the business than the creative side, but that might be exactly what BBC Studios needs right now. Someone with a trusting relationship with BBC TV in particular, end quote, said one producer. And then the article ends with, for CEO Fussell, the strategy is clear. Quote, the key thing for us is the team across the board understands our commercial ambition. We're backed from the top by an extraordinary chairman and Damon Buffini and the board, and we're uniquely placed to take advantage of that. There will, 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 there will no doubt be pressure on buying around the world, but we've already got a strong unscripted pipeline with documentaries and have a sweet spot in scripted. We don't make 30 to 40 million an hour shows, but ones that are smaller run, lower risk and uniquely British, like Rain Dogs. They drive new subscribers, so streamers want them around the world, and with a very good UK broadcaster and a tax credit attached, a lot of the budget is done before you start. That, and you get the BBC stamp of quality. End Fussell quote. And then the last line of the Deadline article is, BBC Studios ongoing regeneration makes for a fascinating story. Got it. So the BBC are happy. Disney seem happy. Russell seems happy. It feels like, uh, what's the Star Trek when they're about to go? All phases set to the... All some quote about initiating, engage. I'm not a Star Trek guy. I don't, I, I, Set phases to stun. Yeah, whatever the quote is, yeah. <laughs> Beam me up. <laughs> full, full, full steam ahead. There's some Star Trek version of that quote. Yeah, it's just engage. That's what it feels like to me. Uh, everyone seems keen to make a lot of content and a lot of money. I suppose. It's it's funny that he uh, specifically says that they're like still engaged with all their previous deals. It's like, are they? So Classic Who's on BritBox right now. And earlier we talked about the opportunity of it returning to, not returning to, but uh, going to the same location as, yeah, so going to iPlayer. Um, but uh, the BBC sold all its shares of BritBox. Yeah. Like they no longer have any stake in it because it's all being turned into ITVX. And I mean, classic Who's days there are, you know, numbered as far as I'm concerned. I don't know when it'll be leaving, but so it's, you know, they're, they're talking out both sides of their mouth, but it's very clear which direction they're headed. If everyone wants to make so much Hooniverse content and, you know, theoretically we want 52 weeks of it, a lot of ideas have to happen. A lot of story has to be generated and fans have opinions on that and wishes for that sometimes. And I see... There's just one, I know we've talked about spinoffs in other discussions, but there's one thing we haven't talked about so much that I really, really, I'm partly confused by, but mostly I'm just annoyed by, which is this tendency to like. So, there's this poster I saw recently, I uh, tweeted out again on Twitter, which is Gwen Cooper on the left and Rose Tyler on the right, and it says Earth Defense down the bottom. Rose Tyler Earth Defense was an old spin-off idea of Russell's that he didn't end up doing, which would be Rose in the parallel world, torchwooding around and defending the Earth. And, you know, people get excited by this. Gwen and Rose, wouldn't that be cool? And I often see, imagine if Torchwood came back and we had uh, Yaz in it and we had Rani in it and we had um, someone else, Canton, in it. Or what if so-and-so came back and we had these characters in it? What if in the unit spin-off we put Gwen in that? What if we parked... The and it's like... I feel like people are treating these characters like, <laughs> I don't know how to put this. It's like they're just parking them around willy-nilly with no real rhyme or reason. Just like we put this character in the, it's, is it? It's like the big finish effect. It's like the Mad Libs randomizer. And I don't understand. I don't want these characters together. It doesn't make any story sense to me. I don't want, I feel like it's denigrating both the character and the show we're talking about. I feel like it's denigrating a unit show just to shove random people into it and say the unit shoken of these guys they're lying around and i feel like it's denigrating gwen to be like just you can go join the unit or you can go join rose that's where we can park you it's like no i don't these are specific characters born for specific stories and i don't feel like they can just be mashed around and that doesn't appeal to me at all why would it appeal to me just to mash random characters together that yeah people are treating 
the characters is independent of stories almost like like almost like a character is a story unto themselves which often they aren't especially when doctor who is concerned i think that people are just sort of plucking characters from the various history of doctor who and going well there's your show whereas in practice what you actually need for a whole show is like especially one based on a doctor who character you need a whole new setting a whole new premise you have to basically make something up you can't you can't just start from having a person in it because what you're going to get is something that ends up just being like a lame clone of doctor who really or just generally empty i think there's some cause for concern here you know obviously the the joke about the nissa adventures was a bit facetious but or at least i hope but you know it it definitely hasn't escaped me that before there were the sarah jane adventures big finish had a sarah jane series and before there was torchwood big finish had its own you know secret spy organization run by an immortal yeah uh in in the forge you know the the whole project miniseries you know project longinus and all that and um and of course we know that one of the very few people who's been announced as someone rtd has tapped for this second era is scott hancock who has a long history yeah at big finish he's done a great job at big finish but um you know i know that russell's a big fan of big finish and that he he stood up for them when it came to the license yeah situation uh when he brought back the show but i really hope that he doesn't adopt their approach of throwing things at the wall you know oh let's take jenny for the doctor's daughter and put her with well i don't know it's it's hard to even parody because they've probably already done it yeah um and i hope that he comes at it from a different angle obviously torchwood was good the sarah jane adventures were good um and i think class had a very particular vision that we didn't see realized hopefully we can kind of stick with that trend but there's some cause for concern there. It comes back to that thing of having faith in Russell, that his, his TV experience will sway him from the big finished approach of just dunking a character. <laughs> we have to just hope. I mean, yeah, he, he's, he's done two spin-offs before, and they have their own premises. We've just got to hope he has that energy again, and he doesn't succumb to the, the fanish impulse to just do these uh, character-based, empty spin-off ideas. Yeah, I think the idea of exploring a setting seems really compelling to me. Like I hear was done in those Kaldor City uh, audios I know you love that are kind of spin off from the Robots of Death from Tom Baker's era. Uh, Kaldor City, who made those? Who are those by? Magic Bullet. You know, in contrast with all the stuff we're talking about from Big Finish. I mean, that is a series that it used exactly the characters it needed to, even if it didn't have the rights to them, right? It, it was like... It was, everything was perfectly attuned to the setting um and there's there's room for expansion but i i continue to think that any spin-offs we haven't seen the roots of yet that any spin-offs will come from either a new concept or something that rtd like brings back but reinvents in a way we wouldn't expect and maybe the fans who feel slightly resentful of rtd for taking over again maybe they can do the spin-offs they can come up through that way you can have all their fan this fanish projects and ideas come to life and form part of the spin-off empire i mean davies might be open to that you know he wants 52 episodes a year if a unit spin-off happens with us just subjugating and subsuming old companions into it as unit workers i'm oh, i'm boycott i'm yeah <laughs> i'm gonna what's what's a star trek yeah, ace and tegan firing bullets and shit there's got to be i'm gonna go full resistance is futile yeah <laughs> i guess probably the wrong quote what, whatever happened to picard at the end of his show you're gonna join the borg yeah i'm i will understand the rage i've seen people express at rtd for his comments so far i will have that rage then if that happens but if, as much as we all have like spin-off concepts we want like the paul mcgann miniseries or whatever it's interesting to think about the spin-offs we don't want i think a lot of fans would have like horror scenario ideas and of course, we don't have to watch them, but yeah, that's an interesting question for people to think about. What spinoff would you not want? Which do you really want not to happen? The Slitheen show, like a sitcom, yeah, like a nightly show where they interview former companions, but it's the Slitheen, yeah. I would not be dying for the Bell and Vinda spinoff, truth be told. I, I don't <laughs> feel there's an enormous... Well, actually, Carvanista in the mix, that might make it a bit more interesting. You don't understand. They're the doctor's parents. OMG. It's, it's all fine. 
Just give him time, okay? Oh, things we don't want. I don't want a spin-off set on Gallifrey. Like, sorry, I, yeah. I just don't. I, I realise a lot of people will um, bristle at that sentiment. But uh, RTD blocked it before. Yeah. He's blocked it once, he can block it again. Yeah, right. I've been I've been chasing down the rumour on that. Um, I have yet to hear back from... Oh, you, you mean the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so fascinating. Oh, yeah, the Fantastico. Yeah, you found it. A great find there. Right, there, there's the old... CBBC pitch about a young doctor series that was potentially turned into their Leonardo show. I've I've been trying to do a lot of research into this and I'm yeah. pretty far from publishing my little write up on it because I'm still waiting to hear back from writers from the Leonardo show to see if there's like any merit to this. But uh, there are a lot of parallels that line up really nicely. We're hugely interested. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll see how it turns out. If it's true, we'll have to all watch Leonardo and talk about it. That uh, that'll merit. Yeah, that it will be unofficial extended universe canon content. So yeah, I'm gonna have to devour. <laughs> <laughs> Gig, you said an interesting thing a while ago that you don't think fan. I'm not saying this for you. You can say this that you don't think fans have internalized that it's up to the show to supersede Tenet with someone better or more interesting. It's not up to it's 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 not the fans' job to like another doctor more than ten. You said something interesting about that a while ago to me. Um, let me try and remind myself what that was. I I, I think it, it's more to do with kind of fourteen and kind of the tenant return, I guess, and, and tenant's popularity, and maybe it applies to RTD too to some extent because you know if this is a a showrunner whose era was very popular coming back. And I think some people have maybe some of the same resentments towards RTD being back as they have to perhaps towards Tenant being back. Because you've got the most popular, fated, revered era of the show storming back. And I think a lot of, well, some fans, maybe not a lot, kind of feel that, you know, this is unfair. You know, this is just, this is just the, you're just, you're just rubbing it in our noses that you were more popular. And I guess um, my feelings on that are that at the end of the day, it's not really, um, like it's not RTD and Tenant's fault that people liked them more. <laughs> it's, it, it's not like it's not the it's and it's not the job of the viewers to suck up and like the next thing more than RTD and Tenant. It, it, it is down to ultimately the show to make people like its newest iteration more than the older ones. And if people continue to prefer the older ones, that's just how it goes. Yeah, you know, it's just it's nothing really. You, know, you can't really uh, hold it against RTD and Tenant for being the most beloved. And yeah, you know, even for for coming back and having that belovedness come back to the show it's not really some great insult if you see what i mean well speaking of doctors and eras eclipsing each other in the fairness of that russell's production notes in the uh in doctor who magazine 587 are all about the trailer for the tenant miniseries and it's a lot of words about there was a bigger trailer designed and it was like, well, is it fair or is it right to put the big trailer out? And they made the trailer shorter. And should we put it out here? Is it too early? And there's all lots of stuff on that. Am I off base in not being that interested in that sort of thing? Like, yep, they put out a little trailer. I feel like there's so many things you can talk about when it comes to RTD2 in this liminal era before it airs. I'm I'm just not very interested in... (laughs) I'm interested in lots of things, but this, like, it's a stretch. I think a certain kind of fan is very fascinated by hype cycles and promotion. The, the experience of being a fan waiting for something to happen. Yeah. And the moments at which, you know, the, the people in charge of the, the content reveal things or you know, do a marketing campaign. I think there's a type of fan who's super interested in all that stuff, which is, I guess, the target audience of this uh, trailer write-up from RTD here. But, you know, it, it, it's not hugely pertinent to the content of the show i think there's a way in which trailers kind of serve the function of almost minisodes in a way they condense an episode down and that's kind of amusing in its own way but it's it's not a patch on the actual content of the show like it doesn't not it does not tell us a huge degree and i think a lot of trailer discourse will become yeah outdated almost it's going to be eclipsed when the actual show airs you could talk about it for real yeah it's so it's so liminal Right, the, the the whole idea of okay, the hype cycle. I mean, I'm I'm not doxing myself to say that I work in marketing analytics, and so I get to kind of see this not with TV shows specifically, but with how they like roll out new, you know, new products, right? New lines of uh, clothes. I, I I can't be too specific, but you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into this, and. Frankly speaking, you know, totally outside of any professional opinion, I think it's all a waste of time. 
Like, I, I don't <laughs> think that it matters that much. You're not going to like sway someone to watch it based on whether you tease it on Twitter a month earlier or later. Right. I mean, yeah, they, they announced that RTD was coming back and they announced that tenant was coming back yeah. years in advance, like well before they needed to. Yeah. And that's fine. That's the choice they made. And I don't think that anything has suffered because of it. Yeah. It just feels like sound and fury to me to really get into, oh, mm-hmm. should it have been six weeks later that they had the trailer. Has, but I'm I'm very dismissive of this kind of stuff. Like, I know I'm very dismissive of, oh, Tenant, I don't want to go. Did it poison the well for Matt? Which I know people who were watching at the time and just some people in general care about heaps. And I think that's very valid. But that kind of stuff just doesn't interest me so much. As interested, in, I get interested in loads of little weird things, but this sort of stuff, not so much to me. But there is one bit in the production notes that I think is interesting where the trailer has no footage from the second special. Russell says, I have a dream that special two could air with no previews. It has an opening scene shot in the wide open air full of surprises, which no fan or passerby saw. So it's still a lovely secret. I can feel mighty PR forces rising up to scupper my plan and we've got a long way to go, although it's down to 10 months already, hooray. So let's see. But for now, the plan is working. You know, it's ironic that RTD didn't have to like shut down and destroy the whole set reporting thing <laughs> to have things be a secret. <laughs> you know, He's actually able to you know, balance both sides, which is uh, quite nice. I like big debates and topics in the liminal era. I don't like um, the trailer should have aired a little bit later. But so we have it. A- anything R2D does, like releasing a trailer, people will complain. <laughs> yeah. No, it's the wrong time. <laughs> yeah. So part four of the comic, 14th Doctor's first story in Doctor Who magazine, Liberation of the Daleks. What happened in this latest bit? I don't know. I haven't read it. Sorry. Oh, gig. I didn't do my homework. It's lost your interest. That's not a great sign. <laughs> well, it opens up the Eiffel Towers in space. Because remember, the Earth got cracked at the end of part three. Daleks have blown up the Earth. 14 is really mad. And he's saying that if, if that was real, you know, you're going to be sorry. And the Supreme Daleks intoning around, let's dissect the Doctor. Daleks do not possess olfactory organs. 14 smelling something weird. Then these weird aliens with lots of toes in these white suits come with a net. And they say, we're taking you, 14. They don't call him 14, but they're trying to take him and... Um, the Daleks don't detect the white suit robo weird things, which the Doctor says are humanish, because he scans them with 13 Sonic. We authorized to use restraint. We're gonna net you. 14's nah. You're not gonna net me. But they net him, and they teleport him away. The Supreme Daleks really annoyed that the Doctor has dissipated. The Daleks all scramble around the TARDIS. We cut to 14, who's in this weird bluish room. Will you promise to behave if we release you? And 14 is like, yeah, sure. And the white suit things unmask themselves and they are. Guess what they are underneath. Guess. In Google, guess. Time Lords? Nope. Uh, Cybermen? Silurians? They are gorillas. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's better than anything I came up with. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then a human woman walks in and says, I'm Georgette. Let me explain. And then we see our purple cone-headed guys there who want compensation from 14 for wrecking their shields and spoiling their watching Wembley and there's a big sign saying main dome this way with a kind of Dalekish silhouette 14 goes up to it the woman says the biggest thrill you'll ever know the greatest adventure you'll ever have and we cut to how to just how to describe this imagery it's like a how would you describe it Nate it's like a panopticon sort of yeah there's a thing floating in the middle with a bunch of uh, yeah, like it's a circular building around it with a lot of people on the railings and uh, observatory in the middle and a lot of right and a lot of images uh, and captions yeah labeling each part of the building like Scaro Civil War Zone and Earth Invasion Zone Vulcan Factory Zone yeah and then Vulcan Factory. And there's a lot of people milling about everywhere. Welcome to the Dalek Dome. So it's kind of like that tourist exhibit of the Daleks thing that I kind of yeah. surmised it might be like a, last time we talked about it. Yeah, 
Okay. Seems to be. Yeah, th- there's kind of something interesting in that, in the idea of like doing Dalek nostalgia almost as a thing. Like, a, I, I realise it's not going to be some meta like masterpiece or whatever, but you know, it's an amusing sort of a topic area. You, you can see the Daleks on the bridge in one of like the photo things as well. The that classic image from Dalek Invasion of Earth. Yeah, I think all of them are actually traced images from. Um, oh, that's cool. From previous stories, including DWM, or oh yeah, I. I s- I see Evil of the Daleks up the top. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, one of them I actually saw someone say uh, was clearly a traced version of a render they had done hmm. on their computer. Wow. So, yeah. It's it's interesting. The I think that was the the factory one. Yeah. It's um, I some things I liked about this issue. I mean, in general, I found this fairly dull, but um, I like that. They blew up the Earth just because... Well, actually, I kind of resent them for it because I was hoping to do that in some piece of fiction I was going to write, basically as a way to troll the TARDIS wiki, just making them say, according to another account, Earth was destroyed in 2023 or whatever (laughs) um, on every page. But unfortunately, this has kind of spoiled that twist. (laughs) I like that the Doctor knew that they were apes before or he knew what they were before they took their masks off yeah because he says something about how he's been kidnapped by a couple of hulking great gorillas yeah you know it's okay like great apes but then um the most important and exciting bit is obviously all the easter eggs you know finally we get into the real adult stuff (laughs) right the easter eggs in a dwm magazine not all that kitty crap there's clearly all kinds of different aliens milling about I see a Slitheen, but I also see Astrons. They're they're the little discs with like worms sticking out. They're kind of hovering. Mm, yeah, these are a deep cut from the nineteen uh, sixties TV twenty one magazine. Oh, they actually appeared in a Fireball XL five. It was like in all the Jerry Anderson universe. They appeared in several comics tying into Thunderbirds and um, Sting. Uh, I forget what they're all called, actually. But uh, one of my buddies, he put in a lot of work because he realized that in these issues of TV 21 magazine, which is where the original Dalek comics appeared in the 60s, um, that there were actually hints and crossovers between the Dalek comics and these strips based on the Thunderbirds, based on Fireball XL5, and even Captain Scarlet. And the Astrons were one of these crossover elements because in, uh, shoot, is it the rescue? When the Doctor hmm. picks up Vicky. When the Doctor meets Vicky in the rescue, their ship has crashed on the way to the planet Astra. And that episode was written by Uh, David Whitaker, I believe, uh, who was also the one writing these Dalek comics and working with the folks from 21 Magazine. So my friend Boris Ashton from the TARDIS Wiki, he has done a ridiculously thorough job of going through like every issue of this kid's magazine from the 60s in a way that only a Doctor Who fan would. And... um. He's done a good job getting a lot of it on the TARDIS wiki. I wrote a little blog post like analyzing all the forgotten connections between ah, nice. the two series. And here, the Astrons are. Uh, I do not think that they would have appeared in this cameo role if not for uh, my friend Boris and his work on the wiki. So shout out to him. Uh, it's really cool that they're there. Very nice. Really cool. It's like the David Whittaker cinematic universe kind of getting a bit of an extension. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And he he's... Is he all of our favorite classic writer? Uh, he's mine. Some of us. He's mine. There's others who are close, but he... Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's up there, definitely. I mean, if... yeah. <laughs> G- G- Gig's very silent. He's up there. Okay. Uh, and those Dalek comics, those TV21 comics, they were a big influence on both uh, the 10th Doctor Time Lord Victorious thing and... The mm-hmm. David Tennant Dalek Universe audio season as well. So yeah, they 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 never die. 
they persist. Yeah, from one Whitaker era to another. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and one Tenant Doctor to another as well, I suppose. Ah, very true. Um, I had one random thing to say about spin-offs, which I you know you can edit this in earlier or something, but just on the on the concept of spin-off premises. Sure. I think a lot of Doctor Who fans maybe haven't quite internalized the idea that Doctor Who is a bit different from, say, Star Wars, in the sense that everything in it is quite ephemeral. There isn't like a Say with Star Wars, you have, okay, you have six movies, you have this timeline, really key events, and you can slot things in between them. Six. With, okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry, more than six, whatever. <laughs> with, with, Doctor, with Doctor Who and this long, you know, 60 year long timeline of episodes and shit, everything that isn't what the Doctor and Companion are doing at a given time is kind of ephemeral and kind of in flux, so to speak. It's always, you know, it's not consistent. It's always being changed. Like, Nate won't understand that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think, um, so I think when it comes to coming up with spin-offs for Doctor Who, I think you have to actually start from scratch a little bit. Because if you just try and take some random thing from an episode, you're not actually going to have, like, the kind of solid, fleshed-out basis for, you know, something like, <laughs> God, I don't know, Rogue One or Andor or whatever the hell you know, Marvel, Disney are doing. I, I think you have to actually you know, do a lot more work. And I think maybe fans haven't, fans of Doctor Who maybe haven't quite internalised the way that Doctor Who just is a, just a bit different in terms of how it's structured. Like, it's not really so much about the lore or the world in Doctor Who or a consistent universe as it is what's just, j- just, it's ruthlessly contemporary. It's just about what's happening right now in our, uh, t- this week's story almost so when you when you get like an actual fleshed out spin-off idea like in Caldor City or whatever that's mostly based on the creator's interest in doing an original story that works in its own right and the aspect of it being a Doctor Who spin-off is almost trivial to some extent they could swap some names out and it wouldn't need to be a Doctor Who spin-off at all (laughs) and um, I think with to some extent almost the same thing is nearly true of something like Torchwood, which I, I don't think it is true, because obviously Captain Jack is hugely based in the main show, but I think you, there are lots of elements about like Torchwood which don't need to be linked to Doctor Who to work. Yes, absolutely. Right? And I think a lot of the spin-off ideas that fans come up with don't quite have that same independence to them. Absolutely. I don't necessarily... I'm not, I'm not so prescriptive as to be like, the spin-off needs to work without Docky Who <laughs> in it. But I do kind of feel like it's a good guiding rule for a spinoff. I think Class was actually a really good example of a spinoff that took an idea from Doctor Who. It was very much like what happens after the Doctor leaves, hmm. right? Hence, you know, there, there were some references and connections with um, Remembrance of the Daleks, right? Which was also set in Coal Hill where all kinds of horrible things happen and then... Um, and then the Doctor leaves. And it was kind of meant to explore the ethical dilemma of that. Um, obviously, it never really got anywhere just because of its cancellation. But yeah, it's 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 like bouncing off the Gwen intro of Children of Earth Day Five, like the Doctor looking away, yes, and not being there. Class is the Doctor leaving the uh, <laughs> the unwanted child of the spinoffs, I guess. Yeah, in a way, I guess having a contrast with Doctor Who and actually exploring like an idea that isn't sort of explored in Doctor Who is in its own way that's an independent thing almost it's not like so it's not something that needs to be removed from Doctor Who but something that nonetheless has its own life separate from Doctor Who because it's about something that Doctor Who doesn't cover yes right so it's not it's not as shallow as just picking up a character and plopping them in like let's generate eight hours of content you see yeah at minimum there would be a tension there yeah I like that um for all the criticism we have of so many of the spin-off ideas ones that actually seem plausible like the unit one or fan ones like what if Yaz worked with Rani and they served Gwen in the parallel universe or whatever. Don't jinx it. Don't jinx it, Neo. (laughs) But I like that, especially for super fans who like have engaged with loads of Doctor Who stuff, we tend to have these little tucked away spinoffs that we actually do think worked super well. Like Nate's talked up uh, Kaldor City. Uh, Gig, I know you listened to some of the faction paradox audios, the Lawrence Mars ones. I think you like those. Actually, I read the scripts. I didn't listen to the audio adaptations by BBV because... That's that's the patrician way to do it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I read the scripts of the Will Lawrence's uh, descriptions in between. Yeah, because I wanted the full Lawrence experience. I didn't want them, like, didn't want the versions with bits cut out and stuff. But yeah, and, and those are, you know, those are very, like, independent. Those are their own thing. You, you do not need to know anything about Doctor Who, to, really, to engage with the Faction Paradox stuff, I would say, as a general rule. And I listened to enough Big Finish that... Every now and again, I find something that works super well. Like the, uh, I've I've listened to all the War Masters that are out so far. I finished those a couple of days ago, and that most recent eighth set was just such a. <laughs> it's, 
it's not as good as the second and sixth set, which are fantastic. The, the second set is oh, the creme de la creme. It's just astonishingly good. But this most recent set was like stories that it it's it's very specifically like a master and specifically a Jacoby master thing. It's, so it's so good to see. This is an idea that you can't do with like if David Tennant was the Doctor and this was a Doctor Who episode, you couldn't do the certain shape it's doing of like the master infiltrating like Sherlock Holmes stories in like a meta way, basically in like tearing them apart from the inside. And you, 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 you really couldn't do this as a traditional Doctor Who story or anything, but it works so well and it exists and it's kind of under the Doctor Who larger umbrella. So there are lots of spin-offs that can work. They just need to be full of kind of extant ideas and like this Machiavellian conniving sadistic Derek Jacoby character infiltrating the land of fiction to like unwrap existing treasured narratives to like steal like, like fictional weapons from within them that's such a zany gorgeous idea isn't it and so good spin-off ideas can happen as much as we trash the bad ones yeah and that wraps up this RTD2 conversation let us know what you thought of any of these topics we covered in here the Star Trek Envy, all these spin-off ideas, the idea of more Doctor Who content in general, uh, those generational conflict ideas, any of those RTD quotes we went through, your thoughts on those publications in general, what spin-off would you not like to see, like we asked? Anything or anything else, things we said, things we didn't say, things RTD said, let us know your thoughts. We always love to see those. And as always, thank you very much for listening. Cheers.